Brilliant. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'd first like to thank the Royal Society for agreeing to host this event in association with Cardiac Risk and the Young, as well as the RSM staff, Carleen, and everyone who behind the scenes has made this possible. Um, we very much appreciate the incredible opportunity to be part of the Medicine and Me programme and to have this opportunity to talk about this important subject in such a fantastic and highly respected venue. Thank you, everyone who's made it here today. I hope your journey has been a bit easier than mine. And um, I know some people have had to attend online because they've not been able to get here. So thank you for everyone who's come here in person, but also thank you everyone at, at home um, uh, or who's joining us remotely. So a little bit of information about uh, the charity, Cardiac Risk in the Young. Uh, CRY is a, a charity which was founded in 1995 to support families after a young sudden death, but also try to prevent um, young sudden deaths. And we do this through raising awareness, support, screening, and research. Awareness that young sudden death is a, it's a thing that young people can die of heart conditions. Awareness of the signs and symptoms. Um, as well as awareness of the importance of uh, screening and doing more to prevent these tragedies. Our support program for families after a young sudden death through peer support with other bereaved families, uh, many resources on our website, um, or to contact CRY if you know a family who's affected, or young people who've been identified with cardiac conditions through the My Heart Support Network. Screening is something that we've always done. We, we were doing screening in 93 before CRY was even founded, and it's a really important aspect of our work. We're testing tens of thousands of young people every year. We've tested over 270,000 people, and screening and research work hand in hand. The screening program is helping us to drive forward our research, which is having a massive impact, and we've got fantastic speakers today who are driving that research forward throughout the world. We put together a program today which highlights many of the questions which families will need guidance on after a young sudden death. There are so many questions which need to be answered and the more families are able to understand what has happened and why it has happened, the greater the possibility there is that they will adjust to what has happened. But we also have to accept that uh, even though much has been achieved in the last 25, 30 years, there is still much to learn. The first question which we'll be looking at today is what causes young sudden cardiac death and how has this knowledge changed in this area? Following on from this, there is an area of confusion which is around the death certificates. We see this at CRY when families don't understand why the death certificate doesn't convey what has actually happened in their family. So we're going to be talking about that. Why is this misleading? Why is it inaccurate? And how does this impact the rest of the family? There is often a great deal of uncertainty and it's only as the family goes through the stages of the testing that some of this un uncertainty goes away. And that's having talked to many, many different people in the medical profession. And, and that's when they'll receive more information about what has actually caused the sudden death in the first place. But even after that, there is still often a great deal of uncertainty after all the tests. And uh, we'll be touching upon that as well. Uh, the further investigations that need to be done and research to better help families after the tragedy and going forward into the future. It's essential that we do everything we can to understand the cause of a young sudden death, but the future has to be about preventing young sudden deaths, um, which is why the final session before the break will start to focus on how we identify those at risk. Following the break, we'll look at areas like risk stratification and ongoing assessment of those who are considered at risk or potentially at risk. And these are new and evolving areas. And as we move forward, and there are more young people living with these conditions, we also need to do all we can to improve and maximize the quality of life for those people who are living with these conditions. So we're going to be looking at that. The, the final session before the panel um, takes questions, we'll look at the new emerging areas in treatment, which has the potential to transform how these conditions are managed in the future. Um, we have a phenomenal panel of speakers here today um, with many years, indeed decades of experience. These are, you know, cardiology, pathology, which had been driving this from the very start, going back 25 years even as well as supporting families at risk of these conditions, the speakers are all at the forefront of the research, which is helping to transform our understanding of the causes and the prevention of young sudden death. 
We're trying to fit quite a lot into the schedule today. Um, so we'll be reserving questions until the final session. I hope that's okay. I mean, in the unlikely situation that the speakers finish a bit early, obviously we can take a, one or two questions at that time, but I think we'll probably be doing that at the end of the day. So on that note, I'll be passing you over to our first speaker, Professor Mary Shepherd. Thank you, Steve. Uh, as I said, he's mentioned that there's no, 30 years almost or that uh, cardiac risk in the young and what has always been so important to me and to cry is the fact of pathology being so important because really to understand or prevent sudden death, you have to know the causes of it. And when somebody dies suddenly, they have, and we're lucky in this country that we have a high autopsy rate, that people have to have an autopsy, particularly if it's a young, sudden, unexpected death, classic, they've been previously well, collapse and die. So a local uh, medical person, you could say legal, orders an autopsy. So what's important, and we've often said, deaths, you can see here how many young people die. There's over half a million deaths in this country and 200,000, nearly half, not quite half, a report to the coroner. He is legal and if there's a suspicious death or unexpected death or a traffic or death in prison, they will automatically be reported to the coroner. So all sudden deaths is important. This is not necessarily true in the rest of the world. Even in Europe, there's a very low autopsy rate. So, and it's a problem with the variation in the causes of death. And I think to really understand it, one has to have a thorough autopsy. And 60 to 70% have postmortems. So we have over 120,000 autopsies in this country per year. The rates are much lower in Scotland and also Northern and Canada. So there's a wide variation in autopsies. Now the coroner, together with his officers on either side there that you can see what an officer does is they actually investigate what the, the actual circumstances of the death so you have the local pathologist will be asked by the coroner to carry out the full autopsy the coroner's officer will investigate the circumstances of the death and then Going on from that, because the majority of the cause of sudden death or cardiac may bring in cardiac specialist pathology, which we provide. And then obviously on to the cardiologists, nurses, geneticists, and general practitioners from there. What do people want? What do families want when they have a tragic event and a sudden unexpected death? They want a fast service. They want to know the cause as soon as possible. They want to get an expert service so they know what they're provided with as the cause is the true cause of the sudden death, an individual for each individual family, the tragic circumstances and an explanation for that. And this is what CRY has been able to provide through funding of a pathology expert service. So working together are the coroners, the pathologists, and you'll also have the cardiologist here, Michael Papadakis and Sanjay Sharma also speaking here. But the most important person, well, from the initial one, is obviously the coroner, because it's a coroner orders the autopsy itself. Now, the ca cardiac, I won't go into detail, just, just say that the majority are cardiac, which will be spoken of by both Michael and also by Sanjay. The heart is a muscle pump. The muscle needs to pump the blood around the body. So you need all that muscle. It's metabolically very demanding. So cutting off its blood supply or damage that muscle will result in a sudden death, right? It's a marvelous organ, right? Only the size of your fist within your chest, as you know. By the time you die, average age of 70 years, it's beaten. 3.5 billion times each heartbeat. So each day you pump 7,500 liters of blood. So it's a very important active organ. The majority of deaths are due to coronary artery disease, 
as you mainly in older people, but in younger people, the cardiac diseases are mainly genetic and inherited. This is what's important to the families and you need to get it right. So the pathologist will eliminate coronary artery disease by examining the coronary arteries. And once you eliminate coronary artery disease, you're looking at electrical abnormalities and muscle abnormalities of the heart itself. And I first got involved with sudden death with Michael Davis, who was my, my mentor, or my trainer. And we published on this a survey carried out in the late 90s. And it was the first one where we had established that coronary artery disease was the majority of sudden deaths in older, in younger patients. It was the first study to highlight this. 7% of sudden deaths were sad, sudden arrhythmic or adult death. This is where the pathologists did a thorough examination and found nothing, what they call a negative autopsy. But until then, this was not accepted in pathology. People would give a little bit of coronary artery disease or give another cause or an unascertained would be said. And unascertained was not useful to a family when unknown cause of death. So it was the first study to highlight that we have an entity and Michael Davis predicted that we will find causes for them. And the major causes, which will be talked about later, will be the electrical activity of the heart itself, abnormalities of the electrical activity of the heart. This, as pathologists, we cannot detect at the autopsy. We will just establish that the heart is absolutely normal. And why we got involved with CRY is through the death of a son and a father two generations, a sudden death while playing rugby. And the mother, wife and mother said, my husband and my child, it was unascertained, she was told at the time, for husband and for the son. She said, there must be an explanation for this. And we were able to give her a cause of death that I was able to review the pathology of both father and son and diagnose arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which is a genetic disease. And then genetic testing could be carried out. And it was found in the mother, the genetic mutation itself. So the other members of the family could be screened cardiologically and genetically and found to be negative. So they could be assured that they were not at risk of dying suddenly from this condition. And following that fundraising within CRY funded the establishment of a cardiac pathology unit, initially at the Royal Brompton Hospital in Imperial College London. And going on from there, we established a laboratory that could handle and examine the hearts that could be sent to us by pathologists from throughout the country, fully funded by CRY. We would guarantee looking at the heart and give an answer to the family and to the coroner within two weeks of getting the heart, to getting receipt of that heart. This was vitally important because up till then there was no funding for doing specialist cardiac pathology or specialist investigation of these sudden deaths. And then the cry unit transferred to George's Hospital in 2014. And here is Alison Cox who actually believed in the value of pathology and in the funding of pathology to give correct answers to the family. And here is the equipment that we use and also funding is still continuing. And with Steve Cox now and Cry, which is vitally important to continue this funding because it's not, the pathology is not funded by the NHS. At this moment, it is totally funded by charity, by Cry itself. And here are the present staff within our department. And we have a lot of documentation. I won't bore you with it because under the Human Tissue Act, we have to be very careful to actually handle the tissue with respect, with the wishes of the family as to the returning for burial or the retention of the material for research. And for most families, we get consent to use the actual tissue for research, which is extremely important for us all. And going on with this documentation is a lot of work. We also established a database giving all the details of each case. And now we've over nearly 8,000 cases, the largest database in the world on sudden cardiac death in young people, again funded by CRY, which enables enormous amount of research to be done at George's Hospital. 
And what's important as well is we train other pathologists. We discuss challenging cases with pathologists, both adult and pediatric pathologists, and both general pathologists as well. We also discuss difficult cases with our pathologists. And here you can see Sanjay, and we've our chief coroner, which, and this is the present chief coroner here, who supports the work that we do. Very important in the training and the training of coroner's officers in dealing with the families who've suffered a tragic sudden death. And going on from that now, Joseph Westerby, my, my colleague here, is now a specialist cardiac pathologist. We're training other pathologists to examine hearts. And this is very important, I think, because we need specialists. You need time to look at each heart like you do specialist cardiologists for these challenging conditions. So this is important training of pathologists. We get hearts from all over the United Kingdom. On average, we get 15 to 20 cases per week. Each of these is a tragedy for the individual families. It's more than what people die, young people dying of cancer. They die of cardiac conditions. We also issue guidelines to pathologists when there is a sudden death with likely cardiac pathology. We tell pathologists what they should do when they get a sudden cardiac death. And the major thing is to look at the heart, retain tissue, and retain material for further genetic testing, which will be talked about later. We also talk to our own Royal College of Pathologists to give them the message about sudden death and young and helping bereaved families and helping prevent further deaths within those families. We also run an adult cardiovascular pathology course for general pathologists. And here's our more recent uh, meeting where we had 100 pathologists from all over Europe and even as far as Australia to spread the message about the correct investigation of these sudden cardiac deaths. We also liaise with fellows, with our cardiologists in the training of future cardiologists as well. Pathology is at the core of this. And we have several fellows who have won many, many prizes because of the quality of the research that has been produced as a result of the funding by CRI. So it's important to go on from that. And here, the CRI itself, I'm sure Steve has already spoke to you, Michael and uh, Sanjay as well, about the fundraising and the actual meetings that we all attend and spreading the research message and the research results that we get from the expertise that have developed over the last 25 years. And we spread the message as well to Europe, the European Association of Cardiovascular Pathologists, that we attend these meetings and actually present our research work. So spreading the word throughout Europe, encouraging. I think here we have a gold standard of investigation and we need to spread that to other pathologists within Europe as well. Going back to the original study of sudden cardiac death, sudden adult death. And what's important for Michael Davis to myself is he was the first man to say, you've got that, the answer is in the heart. This is a human heart. This is where we actually examine the tissue. We take samples, essential to take samples from each case. A heart may look absolutely normal and you need to look down a microscope to examine the heart to look for abnormalities. That is extremely important. And our job is to say, is the heart normal, morphologically normal? So there's an electrical abnormality. Or is it a cardiac abnormality, a cardiomyopathy particularly? And these are genetic or possible genetic underlying conditions for these. Here again are our recent guidelines that we have set up. So look at the heart and we take a piece of spleen, an organ in the abdomen, because it's rich in DNA for genetic testing. And we actually treat this very carefully so that DNA can be extracted from this small piece of spleen. And this is the histology that we do. We take small blocks of tissue and we look down a microscope and we then fill in details in our database and we give a report to the pathologist and to the coroner and that goes on to the family within two weeks of us receiving the heart. Where we, we have developed criteria for the many conditions, the cardiomyopathies and the morphologically normal heart and several other conditions that cause sudden death. 
and we actually define what they are and have crystallized better the diagnosis of each of these conditions. And here is the results from our paper recently published on seven and a half thousand cases. And what it shows you is sad, sudden adult death where the heart is morphologically normal, makes up 53% over half of sudden deaths in young people. Cardiomyopathies make up nearly a quarter of these at 22%. Then we have other causes, which I will not go into detail with you, but it's the largest study of numbers and it's giving vital new information because when I was a young pathologist many moons ago, this entity of sudden adult death was totally unknown. And even the cardiomyopathies were ill-defined when I was a student, when I was a young trainee pathologist. But now we have refined because of the knowledge we have got, we can make precise diagnosis of each of these conditions. And going on, you can see tragically, the majority of people are in the prime of life in their 20s, teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. And it goes off up into the 60s and 70s, but we even still have sudden adult death in people over the age of 60. So age is not a barrier to the diagnosis of these conditions. And you can see here that males predominate, sudden adult death, sudden death, predominates in the male population particularly. And here, what I'll show you briefly is that this is the number of hearts we receive, and this blue here is a number of spleens, the amount of genetic testing that is increasing. Pathologists are taking the material because they have learned and they've been educated that we need to take it for genetic testing to help the family. And this shows the variation, the amount of SADs, what we call in green is sudden adult death where the heart is normal and as possible electrical abnormalities. And here in gold is amount of cardiomyopathies. And there's a wide variation because the studies throughout Europe and America vary widely in the age and the sex and the population itself. But we have the largest database built up and I think the correct information because of the funding that we've been able to get from CRY to concentrate and look at seven and a half thousand hearts and build up expertise over this time, which we hand on to pathologists throughout the United Kingdom and the rest of the world as well. When you're looking, I won't go into detail here because it talks about when there's an autopsy, what happens, we give a report and then going on to the screening of the family in detail. And this is what's important because what it does is investigate a sudden death, right? When, right, woken by alarm, normal at post-mortem. That means the heart was absolutely normal. And then there was genetic testing carried out and a mutation found. And there could be prevention of a death. Her sister found to have the same gene variation as her deceased sister. She later had an internal defibrillator fitted. This helped to save her life two years later when her heart had a life-threatening arrhythmia. So the diagnosis was very important. And now we're building up a national referral pathway for genetic testing after sudden cardiac death. Because every week in the United Kingdom, at least 12 young people mm -hmm. age and die from an undiagnosed heart condition. Right. So that means 750 people die suddenly and prematurely each year to early identification and treatment. Right. We can reduce the risk of premature death from these inherited conditions, which my colleagues will talk about. And we're here to save. You can see here there's been a coordinated effort with NHS England, British Heart Foundation, Cardiac Risk and the Genomics England, the Royal College and the coroners working all together in a multidisciplinary team. This is what's extremely important, which will be spoken about. So developing genetic testing and involving the coroner, coroner's officers, pathologists, cardiologists, as well as geneticists and coordinators and nurses inherited cardiac conditions as well. So seven pilot sites have been established in England to do this. These are the different pilot sites and a consistent pathology practice for sudden, unex sudden unexpected death, including expert pathology in each of these regions have now been set up. 
and the pathologist instructed what to do with each case of sudden unexpected death. So routine retention of tissue, this is very important that we have material from the heart that we can examine down the microscope. This is vital for DNA extraction, the spleen taken for genetic testing and establish coronial and NHS pathways for families can be referred for genetic testing and clinical evaluation and standardized post-mortem with genetic testing via the NHS the actual genetic laboratory hubs that have been established throughout the United Kingdom. And this is the first world in actually where a pathway has been developed routinely for genetic testing and the funding is done by the NHS. This is very, very important. Families do not worry about funding or the coroners do not have to worry about paying for the testing. So pathways have been established in each of these regions the best practice nationally for adoption of this pathway within the NHS. And it's already a year established. And we have the input of patient and support groups as well. Develop evidence base for a national rollout of every sudden death, not just in the seven regions, but throughout in Wales and also in Scotland as well. So all sudden death cases reported, the coroner will go in. Cardiac where someone has survived with resuscitation. Age one to 60 years, not just under 35. And if there's a suspected cardiac genetic cause, that's important, unexplained, despite full coronial and expert cardiac autopsy investigation. And a coordinator has been established to organize the family screening and arrange the genetic testing if that is required. I won't bore you what the criteria are, but we now train pathologists into what they think are the genetic underlying cardiac causes. That's important. Here in one area, it's the North Thames pathway and the Southeast pathway, which we are involved at St. George's Hospital. And you can see here, the pathologist does the initial case. So he takes the spleen, takes the organ, sends it to us for specialist cardiac investigation gives a report to the coroner and then the coordinator, if it's a genetic cause, if the cardiomyopathy or the heart is normal, will then contact the family to have them screen cardiologically and for possible also arranging of genetic testing at the genetic laboratory hub. Right. So the major thing, which is very important, is obtaining the consent. And this can be done very early in the pathway itself, that the family are aware of what is going on and they give their consent for undergoing the investigation and the genetic testing and that they are informed throughout as to what is happening. This is extremely important. And then sending on to an NHS clinic, which will be talked about later. All right. And we have a nurse coordinator as well, who coordinates in our region to an actually liaise with the families, with the pathologists, with the cardiologists. That's important. And we're getting numbers already within this of families that are being screened and genetic testing. And hopefully this is going to change the whole practice that every sudden death will have expert cardiac pathology, expert cardiological screening of the family rapidly and genetic testing as well. So these are the regions which are being done. We're expecting three to four cases per month, but actually, as Joe will say, we're getting about 12 to 20 cases per week. We're getting an increased number we have noticed since this pathway was set up. And I think that's an underestimate of the number of cases we're going to get per region. And really, my thanks to the CRI Pathology Unit at St. George's Hospital and also to the Royal College of Pathologists, which has supported this as well and allowing us to talk to pathologists and spread the word about helping these families and a new national program of family screening and genetic testing. So the CRI has really reached out, I think, where every case is going to be properly investigated. The family is given the correct diagnosis. Their genetic testing has been offered for them throughout the country. And my thanks to all my colleagues at St. George's. I think what's important is getting the full team together, the pathology, the cardiology, the genetics. And I think CRI has played a pivotal role in funding this over the last 27, 28 years. 
Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, there's a lot of very important work happening, taking what we've been doing uh, for many years and bringing it with, into the systems within the NHS, which will really help many, many families. Um, our next talk is with uh, Dr. Joe Westerby, who's going to be talking uh, a bit more about death certificates and uh, why they're often inaccurate or misleading for many of our families. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for introducing me, but also for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I um, and uh, one of my students who I was supervising conducted a study looking at the use of cardiovascular modes of death in the Office of National Statistics, which will spread or give some insight into exactly what is um, being coded with regards to our Office of National Statistics data. So all essentially on a death certificate, normally what we want to see is a underlying disease process but in some cases, I've noticed a mode of death instead of that may be used. So a mode of death is more of a mechanism as opposed to the actual underlying disease that causes the death. The Office of National Statistics holds a large database of all the um, causes of death that are issued from within the England and Wales. And they're all according to the 10th classification of diseases, uh, the ICD-10. So. As I was saying, a, a mode of death is more of a mechanism as opposed to kind of a disease. And these modes of death may be underlain or caused by a number of different diseases. So they're not really specific. So for instance, a cardiac arrest, which can be issued as a cause of death. I'm using that as an example here. There are obviously multiple other ones, but a simple cardiac arrest can be issued as a cause of death, can be caused by a plethora of different diseases. One of the most common is obviously, as Prof has said earlier, ischemic heart disease, but valvular heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, the different cardiomyopathies, including hypertrophic, dilated, and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, as well as sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, and also non-cardiac causes may all cause cardiac arrest. So what we wanted to do was to look at this at the data within the um, national statistics and see how many causes of death were being coded as modes of death. We also will look at non-specific causes as well, and we wanted to suggest some improvements. So NOMIS is the web page that holds all this data and anyone can access that from, um, I think indeed across the entire world, um, and this holds all the census data, as well as all the records for what causes of death has been coded as. So what we did is we looked at all the deaths between 2013 and 2021. That was the latest data that we had. And we found that there were 318 different ICD-10 codes, which were either within cardiovascular, they were under the subsection of cardiovascular disease or other, vas or other diseases, which were modes of death as opposed to being diseases underlying the, the death. So this is what we found. So there were nearly 5 million deaths recorded. Of them, 17.2% or 836,000 were due to cardiovascular causes or modes, as we were saying. At this juncture, the ICD-10 does not have any codes for either arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which is something that we see quite commonly, or sudden adult death syndrome, SADS, as Prof has said. So what we found was that 62.4% were ischemic. Mode was the second commonest thing that we, we found. So there were modes of death issued in 12.3%. 7.2% were hypertensive. 5.6% were related to the a aorta. And then there were other causes in there as well. So when we look specifically at modes, these made up 12.33%. And most commonly, they were issued as an arrhythmia, so ventricular fibrillation or um, ventricular tachycardia um, or a, a sudden cardiac arrest or cardiac arrest itself. Those were the sort of things we found within arrhythmia. And then heart failure was issued in 5.6% of all those. 
And what we can see here is that actually over the years, modes of death have actually increased in their use within the actual Office of National Statistics. But we also found non-specific causes in about 4.28. One of the things which was rather confusing to me is I, I, I'm still not quite sure what myocardial degeneration is, but that was issued in 1.46%, 1.46%, so 12,000 cases. Unascertained, as we've talked about, that may include some of the cases which were sudden adult death syndrome, was issued in 1.27%. And then cardiomegaly, which is an enlarged heart, was in around 1% as well. So to conclude, modes of death and non-specific causes are being used in a considerable proportion of the death statistics. So I'm not, uh, I'm going to speculate as to why that is in a minute. I think we're either looking at the doctors who are issuing it, the medical examiners who are reviewing it, or the, um, the pathologists issuing these causes, or there is following that uh, a cause of death being issued, it's a coding issue with someone taking the wrong information off the death certificate and then putting that into statistics. But also, it's not helpful the way that there are non-specific terms used at the minute. We need to increase the specification of the ICD-10. And hopefully what will happen is with the new revision, which is the ICD-11, there are codes for both sudden um, adult death syndrome and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So that will help with those. The problem with this is it's not useful for us to assess the burdens of these disease in the overall population because the data is not accurate. Um, and they're not helpful for surviving relatives if these causes of death are being used. And if, if we then go on to try and screen for inherited conditions, again, the information is not there from these. Um, so I would, I, I would always strongly suggest that if we don't get an underlying disease and we get a mode or a non-specific cause, that should prompt a referral for autopsy. First of all, it should be reconsidered. Is there anything that we can find in there? So it should be put back to the, the initial person who's issued the death certificate. Then it should prompt referral for an autopsy for further investigation. Certainly, when you find an enlarged heart, that shouldn't just be the cause of death that's issued that should be further investigated to see whether there's a potential underlying inherited cause there. And the transition to the ICD-10, uh, sorry, from ICD-10 to ICD-11 is gonna help with this because there should be less specific causes. So finally, I want to end with a quick case, present, case presentation to illustrate my, my point here. And this is a, a fairly recent case that we saw of a, a young 17 year old who dropped dead suddenly with no past medical history whatsoever. And my heart sinks when I see this sort of thing in the history. So there was a mother in the history that had died five years ago. She was only 38 years old and they'd given ventricular fibrillation 1A and they've given heart failure or left ventricular systolic dysfunction as, as the 1B. Now, that doesn't stipulate what the underlying disease is whatsoever. Presumably, I don't know what's happened exactly in this case, so I can't speculate, but there's five years between that occurring and essentially her young son dying. So there was, there's quite a time lag there. And this is what I found when I looked at the heart. It's a heavy heart. There's asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy, which means that the, the thickening of the wall of the left ventricle is not the same all the way around. And that's a key finding that we see in a certain inherited condition. And there was also patchy fibrosis. And when I looked down the microscope, I saw this. And this is what we refer to as myocyte disarray. So instead of the myocytes all being parallel to one another, they're pointing in all different directions and they're joining instead of end to end, they're perpendicular to one, one another, so end to side. And this is a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I'd like to thank everyone um, for, for listening today. And um, on the left there on that image is our, our, my student, Anne-Marie, who conducted the original study. Um, and I'd like to thank our lab as well. And also, of course, cardiac risk in your so thank you very much.
Interesting. Thank you, Joe. I mean, so really, uh, it, so often we, when families come to cry, we're looking. At, well, we ask for the post mortem before the referral is made to the cardiologist. It's such an important step to ensure the referral pathway is correct. Our next talk today is going to take that to the next stage, which is uh, Michael, Dr. Professor Michael Papadakis, who is looking at the role of expert pathology and why it's essential for first degree blood relatives. Fantastic. Th thank you very much, Steph. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so what I'll try and do is try and establish that connection and highlight the importance between pathology and the clinical cardiologist who's going to investigate the family. I'll apologize in advance. I know we've got a highly varied audience from lay individuals to consultant electrophysiologist. So for some of you, it may be too simple. For some of you, it may be a bit more complicated. But I'm more than happy to chat with you during the coffee break or uh, email me afterwards if you've got any concerns or any questions. So my only conflict of interest is that I'm closely associated with the charity, as you'll expect. So what I'll try to address is the impact of cardiac pathology for the clinician and uh, as such for the family as well. And I'll try to extrapolate a bit to put a bit more detail in those terms that you've already heard from Mary and Joe in terms of a, a definite finding in the cardiac pathology, normal autopsy, what they call sudden arrhythmic death syndrome or sudden adult death syndrome. And I also refer to the autopsies of uncertain significance to highlight the challenges that exist and uh, underscore why an expert cardiac pathologist is necessary really when we were discussing those deaths. Mm -hmm. And I'll very briefly refer to genetic testing after a sudden cardiac death. Now, in terms of the cause of sudden cardiac death in the younger population, uh, uh, Mary and Joe have already referred to them. There are a number of different causes. We're looking predominantly at inherited uh, heart conditions, and those can be separated in what we call the cardiomyopathy. So there is an issue with the heart muscle. Uh, the angionellopathies, where the structure of the heart and the heart muscle is fine, but there is an issue with the electricity in the electrical wiring of the heart and that's exactly how the heart beats or connective tissue diseases and you may have uh, heard the term Marfan syndrome for example or autopathy where the aorta can get very dilated and eventually rupture and result into a sudden death then we've got congenital conditions so the arteries that supply the heart may be coming out from the wrong side and they get squeezed and the blood flow may get compromised and you get a young individual who unexpectedly gets a heart attack while it's something that we see in older individuals. Then we've got extra electrical pathways. Uh, uh, the most common one is something called Wolf-Parkinson-White, which is an issue with the electrical wiring of your heart. And then obviously we can have uh, acquired causes, so not something that someone was born with, uh, but uh, something that happened during their lifetime. And one common cause will be myocarditis, where you get inflammation of the heart due to a viral infection, and that was all over the news during the COVID pandemic uh, as well. So those are some of the main causes of sudden cardiac death in younger individuals. Now, uh, there is quite a difference in terms of the different data sets and databases you will look at in terms of which cause is more important in particular regions. So if we look, for example, at the United States and you look at a young cohort of athletic individuals, then we've got heart muscle conditions like the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that Joe mentioned just a second ago. If you go to the cohort uh, from uh, our group and Mary and Joe, then you will see that there is a big chunk of this pie chart of different causes of sudden cardiac death, which essentially says a normal autopsy. So Mary and Joe, they will look at the heart macroscopically and they can't see anything wrong with it once the general pathologist has excluded any extra cardiac, any causes of death with the brain, with the lungs or any other organs. Then they will look at the heart under the microscope, and that's how really it should be done. So they take small sections, look at the heart under the microscope. They still cannot find anything. And then they will issue a report that will say, morphologically, this heart is normal. We can't see a reason. And then the sudden arrhythmic or sudden adult death syndrome comes into play. 
Now, it's important to highlight that the normal pathology doesn't mean that there is no cardiac condition because all those electrical faults of the heart, like the ion channelopathies or the accessory pathways, that's exactly how they're going to present, okay? So they will cause a very sudden irregularity of the heart rhythm that may result to cardiac arrest, but the pathologist will not be able most of the time to identify anything wrong in terms of the structure of the heart. So a normal postmortem doesn't mean that there is no underlying cardiac condition. Now, Let's uh, stick to the question, are expertise in cardiac pathology necessary? And the obvious answer is no. And uh, sorry, it's yes. And the obvious answer is yes, because uh, the interpretation, sorry, Mary. Uh, the interpretation of the post-mortem evaluation can be very challenging, okay? So people like to think of those things and think it's always a yes or a no clear-cut answer, but it's nothing like that at all. And also we have to admit that there is a lot of science into cardiac pathology, but also experience and having done many cases and being able to differentiate what is what is uh, very important. And the other thing to highlight is that sometimes there can be overlaps. A good example would be athletic, young athletic individuals. Okay, If someone exercises on a regular basis, what happens to their heart? It gets fitter. How the heart gets fitter? It gets bigger. It gets thicker. Okay, And it can mimic some of those heart muscle diseases. And it's important to be able to differentiate what is what. So... This is a nice study that was published by Mary, uh, where they looked at 158 consecutive cases of sudden cardiac death. So they look at hearts that came to the pathology lab uh, at Brompton and St. George's, and they tried to compare the diagnosis that Mary gave compared to the diagnosis that were given by the general pathologist before the heart arrived in our, in our lab. And you will note already that there are some differences in terms of the general pathologist, which is the light blue, compared to Mary's diagnosis. So there are some discrepancies. And what the discrepancies are, it seems that general pathologists may attribute the cause to an underlying heart muscle condition, but then Mary may look at it and say, actually, this is not enough to call it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's not enough to call it arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. It's essentially a normal heart. So we will call it sudden arrhythmic or sudden adult death syndrome, okay? And I'll highlight why this is important because that will put the clinician in a completely different route in terms of how they're gonna evaluate the family. I'll briefly mention this example as well of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which Joe mentioned earlier, where you've got abnormal thickening of the heart, becoming idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, okay? Keep that term in mind because I'll come to it in just a second. And essentially, the disagreement is about 40%, which is massive, okay? So the disagreement between the diagnosis that the general pathologist ended up and the diagnosis that Mary and Joe ended up, there is quite a huge gap there. And that huge gap can make a lot of a difference. And that goes back to the message that they were trying to convey about the need for continuous education and guidelines in terms of how pathology should be performed after a sudden cardiac death. The second thing is that the post-mortem report will definitely guide familial evaluation and will rely to it. And the ideal scenario, if we're going to get referred the family in our clinic, is that we have the post-mortem report before the family arrives in the clinic, because that will dictate how we go about our investigations. So to give you an example, if, for example, a, a Mary diagnoses myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle, or if she diagnoses that the death because, was because of coronary artery disease, the classic heart attack that we get at an older age, then one may come back and say, actually, this is not an inherited cause. This is an unfortunate individual. You do not need to screen the family. Okay, So the family may never arrive to our clinic for further evaluation. If, on the other hand, uh, they say, well, it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that cardiomyopathy that causes abnormal thickening of the heart, then my evaluation of the first degree relatives of the disease, because this is a genetic condition, 
will not be particularly extensive because a simple tracing of the heart, a simple ECG and a simple ultrasound scan of the heart will suffice in the great majority of cases in diagnosing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I may do that and stop there. On the other hand, if she says that actually what I'm seeing here doesn't quite fulfill a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, please consider it as a normal heart then we will have a very comprehensive evaluation which will go way beyond ECG and ultrasound scan, looking for those electrical faults of the heart. And you may have heard the terms of Brugada syndrome, LOQT syndrome, so on and so forth. And this is really the extent of the evaluation that a normal post-mortem will get, okay? So if anything, when I get a report of a normal post-mortem, I'm gonna put the family through lots of different steps, and they will have lots of different investigations, a very comprehensive screening, in order for me to give myself the best chance of identifying a condition in those first degree relatives. It will not be just an ECG or an ultrasound scan of the heart, okay? And that's a key message. So normal postmortem actually means more comprehensive evaluation required rather than the other way around that naturally may come into people's mind. And the reality is that if you investigate families properly, and that's a bit dependent as well on what, which are the relatives that you get, because as you realize, if you suspect an inherited condition of a disease, ideally you would like to have mom and dad to come to the clinic, but for different reasons that may not always be possible. So that would influence your yield of your clinical evaluation. But if you get the families and you get the comprehensive evaluation, in our clinic, on average, we'll identify a condition in a first degree relative in about 40% of cases, okay? And the majority, because this is a cohort of such families with normal autopsy, will be ion channelopathies, electrical faults of the heart, such as Brugada syndrome and long QT syndrome, okay? And that will be based on about one in five first degree relatives who come to our clinic with no previous diagnosis or notion of having a heart disease being diagnosed as having a heart disease. Once we diagnose a first degree relative with an inherited or potentially inherited condition, then we make a reasonable assumption that that's the most likely cause of death for their loved one. So a general diagnosis of SADS, sudden arrhythmic death syndrome or sudden adult death syndrome, then becomes Brugada syndrome or long QT syndrome. And then we know what we're looking for in the rest of the first degree relatives, as well as the more extensive family. Now, the other thing I wanted to come back to is that degree of uncertainty. So as I said before, and I'm sure uh, Mary and Joe will agree, cardiac pathology is not black and white. Okay, there is a degree of grayness in there, and that's where experience counts as well. So it's very important to remember that if we've got a post-mortem evaluation, as I said before, remember I told you if it's such, we need very comprehensive, all those different investigations that I highlighted. If we've got a well-defined pathology like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we may go into our ECG and our echo that we discussed before, but then the question is what happens if there is uncertainty? So there are some valve lesions, there is a bit of hypertrophy, but Joe looks under the microscope and he cannot see that myocardial disarray that he was trying to explain to you, which is the sign to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What should you do? And the answer is that you will probably need to follow the SADS route and do a more comprehensive evaluation. So in a way, be on the safe side to ensure that you don't miss anything rather than be more conservative and miss some of the diagnosis. And that's the practice we've got in our clinic. And this has been verified by this very nice study that we published in 2013 uh, uh, through uh, autops uh, through our clinic actually, back then it was Louis Sam in St. George's. And what we went and did is we looked at pathology findings. Those are not reported uh, uh, by Mary. Those are from general pathologies that we included anything that we thought that looked a bit suspicious. Okay, and you'll see that there are here a fibro scar of the heart, dilatation of the heart, valve disease attributed as the causes of death. And then the point we try to make is that if you go and evaluate their first degree relatives, 
then in a significant proportion, roughly about 40%, you'll identify something else. You'll identify an electrical fault of the heart. In a small proportion, you may even identify heart muscle disease. And again, about one in five, same number keep coming up of the first degree relatives will be diagnosed with a condition they didn't know they had before, okay? The problem with that is that this all could have been missed opportunities if the cause of death was attributed to a dilated heart because either they may not get referred or if they get referred, they may get an ECG and an echo looking for dilated cardiomyopathy, okay? And the nice thing about that study, which was extremely important back in 2013 was, was published, is that our Australian colleagues and actually one of our CRI fellows who moved to Australia and became a consultant, tried to replicate the study and he found exactly the same results with post-mortem findings and families from Australia. So the message seems to be fairly consistent. And here, I know it's not particularly pleasant, but I just wanted to show an example of a family where that's a coronary artery and they thought that was blocked, but eventually, and they said heart attack. But what ended up happening is we screened 13 family members and five of them had that electrical fault of the heart called Brugada syndrome, okay? Now, last example is that issue that I tried to discuss before, differentiating a thick heart for different reasons compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? And again, that was a PhD that was performed by Gerardo Fenocchiaro, who was one of our CRI fellows, and now he's one of our inherent cardiac conditions consultant at St. George's Hospital. And again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you must be bored of hearing that we do an ECG and an echo, idiopathic LVH, so you've got a thick heart that does not fulfill the criteria that Mary and Joe what? What do you do? Do you call it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And to answer that question, what Gerardo did, he took 46 victims of sudden cardiac death from Mary's database. He invited their first degree relatives to come and he said, I'm not going to do just an ECG and echo. I'll investigate them fully as if I didn't know what the cause of death or if it was a normal autopsy, okay? And indeed, he did that, including a cardiac MRI to look at the heart in detail. And what he identified is he found a condition within the family in about 30%, so a bit lower than 40% I told you before. 13% of relatives were diagnosed, but what's the key here? None of those individuals, none of those families had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, either on clinical evaluation or genetic testing of the disease, which essentially means that a thick heart, even if it looks like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you need to look under the microscope and make sure that it is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because it may be something completely different. And that's where mistakes keep happening. Just before I finish, I wanted to highlight also the importance of genetic testing, what we call molecular autopsy. What does that mean? And Mary referred earlier, we try and I will urge you, whether you're a family member, whether you're a GP, whether you're a cardiologist, it's important that that happens. If there is a death in the family, if there is a death of a friend, and the suspicion is that there may be an inherited cause, we need to try and retain genetic material. It's a small piece of spleen, uh, which is the best uh, material, so we can do genetic testing on the disease, okay? And again, the pathology, the cardiac pathology will guide that genetic testing. Why genetic testing is very important on the disease? Because if we don't find a mutation, then we can proceed with a familial evaluation, exactly as explained to you in the clinic. But if we find the gene that's causing the condition and cause the sudden cardiac death, then that becomes much more useful for the family, okay? And if we've got a definite cardiac pathology like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or another heart muscle disease, then the yield can be up to 40, 50, 60%. If we've got a normal autopsy, it's less than that, about 15 to 20%. So in conclusion, sudden cardiac death in young is often attributed to inherent cardiac conditions. So we've got an opportunity in a way within a tragedy to prevent further tragedies. And that case that Mary showed of the father and the son dying after a few years or the case that Joe showed makes exactly that point. 
Post-mortem evaluation is key because it will inform the familial evaluation, the clinical evaluation that the cardiologist will do. It will inform genetic testing, and we will offer a targeted approach to that particular clinical evaluation. There is no doubt, however, that there are many, many challenges where, uh, still. There are things we understand and the things that we're still learning, and that's an important message, and that's why experience uh, counts, and that's why training of pathologists in cardiac pathology is vital. And as I said, don't forget to retain material for genetic testing. And I just wanted to highlight again what Joe and Mary said before, that this is a multidisciplinary process, okay? And that's why expert centers are necessary. This is not a case of a single cardiologist in district hospital looking at the brother of a deceased, okay? You need to have the right group of people in terms of ensuring that you do the right job and serve the families well, uh, but also you need to have the right support network in order to support that family before they come to the clinic because the consultation can start three, six months before they end up in the clinic while they're in clinic and once they've left the clinic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Um, our final talk, which is really focusing on pathology, is going to be once again a, a second talk from Dr. Joe Westby, looking at some of these unanswered questions in cardiac pathology. Thanks again for that introduction. Um, so now I'm going to uh, quickly speak about some unanswered questions. I've, I've slightly changed this to questions we are helping to answer. I've got a couple of studies, one that's about to be um, published and the other one that's um, under consideration for publication. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the role of obesity in cardiac enlargement and sudden cardiac death. And then I'm going to talk about delineating the malignant phenotype in mitral valve prolapse. So obesity cardiomyopathy um, will be the first one I'm going to speak about. And obesity is an increasing epidemic within the world. It's now affecting 13% of the population. It's normally associated with other conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and coronary artery disease, which may cause sudden cardiac death. But there is a cohort in which you get enlargement of the heart and you can get left ventricular failure. And essentially, you find this where there are no other causes. So you don't find coronary artery disease. You don't find hypertension. There's no diabetes. And that's increasing in incidence. And currently, as it stands, we don't have any well-defined pathological criteria. So we don't know really what exactly we're looking for when we examine these hearts. So we have about 6,500 cases of sudden cardiac death. And of these, we had 4,000. 500, which had a BMI recorded. We had 1,200, which were obese. And from those, we found 53, where we couldn't explain why the heart had been enlarged. And then we had 1,691 cases with a normal BMI, which had 14, where there was no reason we could find the cardiac enlargement. So these are excluding things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the other cardiomyopathies that we've talked about. So what we did is we age and sex matched all these cases. So we took 50 th those 53 cases and age and sex matched them to the others. But what we could see is that when you look at this, there's an odds ratio of 5.3. That means that obese people are five times, 5.3 times more likely to have an enlarged heart in our cohort than a, people with a normal or healthy weight BMI. So these 53 individuals had a, 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 an age of 42 uh, with a standard de deviation of 12, and they were mainly males, which actually exists throughout most conditions within the sudden cardiac death cohort, so 64% males. And normally the death occurred at rest, so in 90%, and there were no preceding symptoms that were listed in the history and around 90% as well. The males tended to die slightly younger, so five years before the females, 40 compared to 45, and that was significant. And the BMI, you can see, was much higher in individuals who had this unexplained cardiomegaly than in the individuals who were just obese. So it was over 40. And our average heart weight, so the average heart weight or the, or the maximum we would accept for a normal heart weight would be 550 in males 
and 450 in females. But you can see in these, it was an average of 600. And these are just some images explaining or illustrating the findings. You can see a normal heart on the right hand side there. There's a, uh, an, a heart from an obese individual with slightly more fat on it in the middle. And then the enlarged heart in, in this individual with obesity cardiomyopathy on the, on the left hand side there. So what we saw when we looked at these, we did extensive detailed measurements is that we had an increase in the muscle thickness, both in the left ventricle, but also in the right ventricle. And we also got an increase of that fat around the outside of the heart. And in some, we saw a little bit of um, fibrosis. You can see that illustrated on the right hand image at the bottom in the microscopy as well. And fibrosis is scar tissue that we see in the heart. And that can also explain why some of these individuals had a sudden cardiac death, because that can act as a focus for a lethal abnormal heart rhythm. So to conclude, we found that this was a specific entity associated with sudden cardiac death. Uh, Obesity definitely seems to play a role, but we're not sure it explains everything in these cases. It seems that it's found in individuals with a, high, a considerably higher BMI than just obesity, because we're looking at an average of 40, and it also tends to affect males at a younger age. And for pathologists, we decided that we should diagnose it when there's an increase in heart weight above 550 in males and 450 in females with a BMI of over 30. And what we want to do is in these individuals, we're going to suggest that they're all followed up by cardiologists. And we also do molecular autopsy or screening the screen to see whether we can find any uh, possible inherited conditions in these, because we can't be sure at this moment as to whether there might be a genetic role or um, underlying this as well. And I'll speak slightly more on that a little bit later, but we, um, we got the best abstract award at the Association of Inherited Cardiac Conditions for this abstract. So the second thing I want to briefly talk about is mitral valve prolapse. So this is essentially um, another cause of sudden cardiac death in young. And what we're looking for is the mitral valve to balloon, it essentially balloons upwards into the atrium. Um, and I will show you a picture of this coming up. But fibrosis is found again in the, um, in the heart muscle in these individuals. And that can explain why they experience a sudden cardiac death. But currently, as it stands, it's very difficult for cardiologists to know which people are at risk of dying suddenly compared to which people are not at risk. So there's a complete spectrum of mitral valve changes from normal on the left hand side here to very abnormal. So that's the normal paper thin valve that you can see on the left hand side there. And on the right hand side, you can almost see it ballooning upwards. It's much thicker and it looks very abnormal. But there's also ones where we're kind of in between. So what we wanted to do was to establish whether we could find pathological criteria to diagnose these. So what we wanted to do is we compared our cohort of mitral valve prolapse, which had resulted in sudden cardiac death, versus age and sex matched females to see how the measurements of these valves differed. So these are all the different measurements you, we took. We looked at the, the length of the leaflet. We looked at the annulus circumference, so that's how big the atrioventricular junction was. And then we looked at various different zones and how thick the leaflets were, but also we looked at how far off the muscle the valve lay as well, because that can be stretched in these individuals and enlarged. So our overall cohort consisted of 120 cases of individuals who died with this condition, which was 1.5% of all our cases. They were 39 years old on average. There was, and this is different from normal, there was a one-to-one -one ratio between males and females. So females did equally badly with this condition. Normally it's about two to one, so males tend to do worse. And 15% had a history of mitral prolapse, but were not considered to be at risk. And 9% of these died while they were exerting themselves, but the rest died at rest. So mainly people were dying at rest. We found fibrosis in 90% of these, and most of the time it was in the back wall of the heart or the posterior or, and the, the, the lateral wall of the um, ventricle or the left ventricle. Um, so this is just showing that they were evenly matched. So we did a matching at two to one. So we had 54 controls compared to our 27, but you can see they're the same age, 
and obviously the same sex is between. But when we looked at them, all these measurements, we could see they were all very, very significantly enlarged in these. So what we hope is that this will help establish what we're looking for when we're, we're, we're evaluating individuals with mitral prolapse. Hopefully these measurements will serve, first of all, to make a diagnosis for pathologists, but also in a living cohort to see whether these may help identify individuals who are at risk of sudden cardiac death. And I think currently we're probably under diagnosing this because I think there's a lack of awareness within the um, general autopsy community. So I, I, I want to raise awareness of this. And um, I think we may in future find that there are more of these cases than we're necessarily see, seeing. Um, so with regards to future work, I wanted to speak quickly about the um, exciting developments that are being made. So I think what we want to do in the future is look at the role of other conditions. We'll look at diabetes, potentially looking at individuals who expose themselves to alcohol and drugs and things like that, because it's not just important to identify inherited conditions, but also to rule out whether there's an inherited condition as well, because obviously we don't want to advise families are screened when, there's, when that's inappropriate as it places additional stress on the family. Um, but we don't want to miss anyone that might have an inherited condition as well. We want to correlate with the genetics that are being found, so correlate the pathology with the genetics and see whether some of the genetics have specific findings that we may see within the pathology. We want to also look at populations where there isn't any genetics or any genetic cause that can be identified and see whether potentially we can identify some environmental causes within those cohorts. We want to also integrate the use of artificial intelligence and digital pathology within our unit. I think that's going to be an exciting advance uh, with regards to um, pathology in itself, and it's coming in the NHS, but hopefully it will come soon to us as well. Um, and then one of the other things that we're doing is looking at um, RNA analysis within different regions of the tissue as well. And I think that um, has the potential to explain a lot of the pathology that we're seeing. And then finally, looking at polygenic risk scores. So there are now polygenic risk scores where essentially you look at lots of different genes within the human genome and certain things will be mutated or variated. And therefore they may place you at a higher risk of developing hypertrophy or enlargement of the heart. So I think that will be exciting to integrate into the pathology as well. So thank you all for your attention. And again, thank you to our labs and thanks to Cardiac Risk and the answer. Thank you, Joe. And um, yes, yeah, so that's the final talk, really focusing primarily on pathology, but we've seen how important this is in how we're looking at uh, young individuals and uh, families. And uh, on that note, welcome to stage our, our last talk before the comfort break um, with uh, Professor Sanjay Sharma. I think, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> so um, talking about how we identify young people with cardiac conditions. Thank you, Sanjay. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Steve, to be honest. Um, I'm going to talk about how we can identify young individuals with cardiac disease. And the objectives of my talk are as follows. I'm going to dis describe who should be investigated. I'm going to describe current methods of evaluating family members of victims of sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. Then I'm going to highlight practical methods of screening asymptomatic individuals for cardiac disease. That's a more controversial point because we don't normally offer screening for completely asymptomatic people on the NHS. But let's start with sudden cardiac death in the young. Clearly the death of any young individual is a very tragic event for that particular family, but also for the community, the peers, for sporting clubs, because people don't expect young individuals who are apparently healthy to die. As you can see from this photograph, every single individual in this photograph looks very well and healthy. And these individuals clearly lose, uh, you know, decades and decades of life. So there is a great incentive to identify um, these individuals and what actually kills them. But you've already got, you've already heard some very good pathology talks. So mine's a bit of a noddy guide approach to what kills people with heart disease. But clearly, it, something could go wrong with the heart muscle. These are the cardiomyopathies, the electrical system. So things like Wolf Parkinson White disease or progressive cardiac conduction tissue disease. And at molecular level, there may be something wrong with the ion channels causing long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, 
or catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. You've just heard that valve disease can also cause arrhythmogenic sudden cardiac death in the form of mitral valve prolapse, and bicuspid aortic valves may be associated with aortopathy, which can predispose to aortic root rupture or dissection. And then, of course, you've got problems with the blood supply, either anomalous coronary artery origins or premature atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, and finally, the aortopathies. So who should be investigated? Which, is, which bit is absolutely cut in stone and no one can argue with? Well, all young individuals with cardiac symptoms should be investigated. So any young individual complaining of chest pain during exertion, breathlessness that is disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed, palpitation, episodic lightheadedness when pushing themselves or loss of consciousness. These individuals, if they go to see their general practitioner, should be referred to a cardiologist. These are important symptoms. The second group is individuals with a family history of premature cardiac disease or sudden cardiac death. By premature cardiac disease, I'd say someone, anyone with a family history of someone who's got disease under the age of 50 years old should be checked because many of the conditions I've just described are genetically inherited with an autosomal dominant trait, which means if a parent or a sibling has this condition, there's a one in two chance that the affected family member may also have it. And the third one is individuals with transient seizures. If someone is dealing with someone who's had an epileptic seizure, I think it's actually crucial to get a 12 lead ECG done, not just refer to a neurologist because transient seizures may be due to transient near fatal arrhythmias, particularly in things like long QT syndrome. So for these people that should be referred, what sort of investigations would be performed? Well, we've got a large uh, collection of investigations that can be performed, ranging from those simple, such as the ECG, to more complex ones, such as prolonged ECG monitoring and cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging scan, the preliminary tests in the form of ECG and echo, and obviously the history and the family history will govern how far we take it and whether we take it into the electrical disease channel or the imaging disease channel. So let's talk about sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. You already heard about this condition. This is a sudden death in the absence of microscopic or microscopic, uh, macroscopic or microscopic abnormalities of the heart and when the toxicology screen is normal. In a, a data set in New Zealand and Australia, this condition accounted for 40% of all deaths in young individuals. And you saw from Mary's database that our data set suggests it's even larger than that, over 50%. And what Michael told you is that when we go back and we investigate the family members of these decedents of sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, when we investigate them comprehensively, here is data uh, of um, families, 300 families, including 911 members who were investigated very comprehensively, we found that there was evidence of an underlying ion channel disorder in 40% of these families. So a significant proportion of SADS deaths are due to inherited ion channel diseases. So how do we go about investigating people who are family members of SADS victims? Clearly, you take a personal and family history, and that family history, uh, that personal history uh, really checks for things like syncope and palpitation. You go through the family history, usually three generations worth, and you do a clinical examination. Now, I'm a cardiologist, and I'm very proud of my stethoscope, but I'm sad to say that the stethoscope is very rarely helpful in most of these conditions. We then go to the 12 lead ECG, which is my favorite investigation. And that can yield quite a few things. Things like this here, the Brugada pattern, where you've got this RSR pattern with J-point elevation, a coved SC segment with T-wave inversion and B1 and B2. We look for things like a long QT interval. And we look for things like short PR intervals with a slurred upstroke to the curious complex, looking for things like Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Sometimes the ECG shows something that may be suspicious of the Brugada ECG phenotype, something like this, where you don't quite fulfill, doesn't quite fulfill the Brugada phenotype, but there is this RSR pattern with saddle shaped uh, ST segments. You see that in V2. And in this particular situation, what we recommend is that the ECG is repeated by, uh, by changing the position of leads V1 and V2 into the second or even the, the third or the second or the third intercostal space. And that may, 
these leads then look at the outflow track of the right ventricle and may show up the Brugada phenotype. And if you see that, those sort of people then should be subjected to a provocation test with agimeline to actually show that they probably do have the Brugada phenotype. If the ECG is abnormal, uh, is normal, sorry, we go on to do uh, uh, imaging tests. You will say, well, hold on a minute, someone died from SADS, it's an ion channel disorder, but molecular autopsy studies have shown now that a proportion of these deaths are due to covert cardiomyopathy because we've uh, they've actually identified pathogenic variants capable of causing cardiomyopathy. So we do do uh, cardiomyopathy tests. We look for things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and other cardiomyopathies. If that's normal, or if you've got an investigation such as slightly anomalous ECG patterns or slightly anomalous echocardiographic patterns, we proceed to doing an MRI scan. And we do that on people in people with abnormal ECGs, which are not diagnostic of any particular condition, or someone who's got an echocardiogram, which may show a slightly enlarged left ventricle, slightly hypertrophic left ventricle, mild regional warm motion abnormalities. And these people go on to have uh, MRI, which is uh, better at characterizing tissue, uh, showing um, asymmetric patterns of left ventricular hypertrophy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and showing scar tissue and regional wall motion abnormalities in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is a typical example of an abnormal ECG you see here uh, with a, a cyclist with T-wave inversion who's got quite widespread T-wave inversion, a delayed upstroke to the S-wave in V2, an epsilon wave, and low QRS voltages. This individual was investigated in more detail and had evidence of ARVC. If all these tests are normal, we don't stop there. We, we proceed to an exercise stress test. And the exercise stress test does have a, a very important role. Certainly we use it a lot in our clinic and it, it may unmask the Brugada syndrome, Brugada ECG pattern. It may reveal paradoxical prolongation of the QT interval. It may provoke VT or unmask CPVT, and even demonstrate features of myocardial ischemia. But here is an example of an exercise stress test unmasking the Brugada phenotype. You'll see that pre-exercise, there is evidence of the type 2 Brugada ECG pattern. And at peak exercise, you start seeing the, the, Brugada, the type 1 Brugada ECG pattern uh, appear. And as soon as you remove the adrenergic stimulus and you've got increased vagal tone, you, you can see this evidence of the type 1 Brugada ECG pattern. We don't see it often, but we do see it sometimes. It's something that we always look for. Also, this phenomenon, paradoxical prolongation of the QT interval, the current uh, diagnostic criteria for long QT syndrome, don't, usually, don't feature this anymore. This response to exercise, certainly as the exercise proceeds, looking at the QT interval. But I find this very useful at least from the baseline heart rate to a, heart, a ventricular rate of 120, we record ECGs every 30 seconds. And you can see very quickly in those people uh, that you will probably ended up having the condition that they get this paradoxical prolongation of the QT interval. Then, of course, we look for these polymorphic VTs or bidirectional VTs or CPVT as well. If everything's normal, which is often the case, we tell the individuals that we haven't excluded uh, the concealed form of the Brugada syndrome, and these people are often invited to have an adjuvant provocation test. So here, so here is a, a person pre-test, and we usually put place the leads, the V1 and V2, in the conventional positions, but also in the second and third intercostal space, and we give adjuvant uh, very in a very controlled situations. And you see, there, there you go, you develop the actual, uh, the uh, Brugada pattern. What about athletes and the young general population? Now, obviously, people are, people, it's hard, harder to argue with elite athletes. They are on TV on a regular basis. And if one of these succumbed on TV and the elite organizations had not looked after their hearts, there would be uproar in the media. We know that these athletes die from inherited and congenital abnormalities of the heart, a diverse spectrum of diseases. And when we investigate or we screen these athletes, we find that one in 300 young athletes have a condition, one of these conditions that could potentially kill them. If we look at our own screening program uh, with cardiac risk in the young, this is data on over 104,000 104, 104, people aged uh, between 2008 and 218. We find as well that the prevalence 
of a serious condition capable of causing sudden death in the general population is also 0.3%. So how do we investigate this? This is mass screening. Yet death rates, although uh, very emotional, are less so than in the elderly population. And you will see that the more tests that we add, the greater the diagnostic yield, but then cost becomes prohibitive. So whatever we do when it comes to mass screening has to be cheap and cost-effective, readily available and easy to interpret. So we normally rely on history, examination and the ECG. The sensitivity of the ECG is only about 20% because most people that die have no warning symptoms at all. And the sensitivity of physical examination is only 9%. So we rely predominantly on the ECG. So the ECG will show up things like long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, and Wolf, Parkinson, White. The ECG is often abnormal in people with cardiomyopathy. 95% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have an abnormal ECG. If you look hard enough, 80% of people with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy have an ab abnormal ECG, as do 75% of people with dilated cardiomyopathy. So does it make a difference when we identify these people? This is data from the FA on 11,000 adolescent athletes that, were, that underwent mandatory assessment. And you'll see that the, uh, we picked up 0.38% with serious chronic conditions. So what happened to these people? Some were advised not to play sport. Some were treated surgically and returned to play. And some were ablated and returned to play. At the end of this 10 year period, 95% were still alive and 74% returned to play, but two died. Uh, they competed against medical advice. So it does make a difference. Has the CRI screening program made a difference? Well, here's data from 104,369 people over, over 10 years where 0.3% were identified with a serious cardiac condition. After receiving a diagnosis at secondary care, 37% of these people underwent potentially life-saving treatment, 93% had ablations, 10% had a permanent pacemaker implanted, and 10 individuals had an ICD implanted. So in conclusion, young individuals with cardiac symptoms or a family history of premature cardiovascular disease should be investigated, should be referred for sure. Young family members from families with inherited cardiac diseases should also be investigated. For athletes and the general population, basic screening with health questionnaire and ECG is effective for diagnosing young individuals with cardiac disease. However, it's important, and you'll hear this in my next talk, that a normal test does not exclude disease or the potential of developing disease in the future. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you everyone. Um, welcome to the afternoon, well, the later afternoon session. The first talk um, is with Michael, looking at how to risk stratify young people with cardiac conditions. Fantastic, wonderful. Uh, so uh, we go a bit more clinical in the afternoon and uh, the question I was asked, how do we re-stratify young people identified with cardiac conditions? Again, I, I kept in mind that we do have quite a mixed audience uh, and more than happy to answer any questions or have a discussion at the end of the, of the session. Uh, so in terms of what I'm going to address is the tools that we've got available for assessing risk. And I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. Um, I focus on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hermogenic cardiomyopathy, and one of the electrical faults, the long QT uh, syndrome. Now, I'll start with an important message, however, is that before you start re-stratifying people and giving them advice, it's important to make sure that we get the diagnosis right, okay? And it may seem like a very basic uh, 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 advice, but, uh, you know, sometimes people do get the diagnosis wrong, and that's why it's important, again, that you, uh, the family is evaluated, or the individual is evaluated uh, in the right center with the right expertise. And I've just put an example of... Uh, a, a potentially challenging cases, and that will be young athletic individuals, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, 
the good thing about young athletic individuals is that they exercise on a regular basis and therefore they reduce their overall cardiovascular risk uh, as, uh, and uh, other conditions as well. Uh, but what happens is the heart will adapt and become in a way stronger. So what you've got is that all chambers of your heart will dilate and they may mimic a cardiomyopathy such as dilated cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And also your heart muscle will become uh, thicker, okay? Uh, uh, in a way like training your biceps, if you want. And that can overlap with conditions such as hypertrophic, dilated, arrhythmogenic, and something else called left ventricular non-compaction. And you will have to ensure that the people who fall within that, what we will call the gray zone, so either they have a form of extreme athletic adaptation or a mild form of cardiomyopathy, that you get it right, okay? Because again, it's important to remember that a mild form of cardiomyopathy, so the fact that your heart doesn't structurally look terrible, very thick, doesn't exclude the possibility of being at risk of arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. So let's make sure that we get the diagnosis right. Now, in terms of assessing the risk, uh, the good news is that yes, we can assess the risk for most conditions. And as you realize yourself, it will be there will be very little point to try to identify conditions. If there was nothing that we could do about uh, those individuals. Uh, what sort of risk are we trying to assess? Well, the first concern is of any malignant irregularities of the heartbeat that can result to cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. That's what we're trying to prevent. But aside from that, we can potentially assess the risk of disease progression depending on the condition and provide the necessary advice. And in my next talk, I will discuss lifestyle and uh, exercise. It is important, however, to remember what I said before is that, yes, we do know uh, things about conditions, but there are lots of unknowns as well. And when we go and restratify and advise individuals, it's important to keep those limitations in mind when we're having the discussion with the family in terms of restratification, okay? Because sometimes you've got cardiologists that are very absolute that someone needs an ICD or does not need an ICD, depending on uh, the condition, the criteria that they fulfill. But a lot of the time, there is a degree of uncertainty and that risk becomes a bit subjective, okay? So the risk perceived by a mother who has three children may be completely different by the risk that perceived by a 60 year old man who doesn't have any children, okay? And they may have different preferences, even if the risk is exactly the same based on the condition. And I think that's important to keep it in mind. Now, in terms of informing risk, the way we go about it, we will look at the patient characteristics, the patient demographics, their age, their gender, so on and so forth. We will look at the specific disease characteristics, and we know that not all diseases are the same and they carry different risks. And sometimes it's also important to note that follow-up. So we need that follow-up. We need that one, two, three years potentially to assess the risk of that individual because time may help us decide on how quickly is the disease progressing. Do you have someone who has stable disease over many years, or do you have someone that you see today and after a year, their heart looks completely different because the condition has progressed quite quickly. So if we look at how we go about restratifying patients, the one thing I'll say is that you need to have a systematic approach, okay? You need to have the knowledge and you need to have a systematic approach as how you will go about it. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that although uh, we think about technology, we think about advanced investigations, we do think about doing that and this and the other to try and define risk, the reality is that for most individuals with inherited cardiac conditions, we need to go back to the basics, okay? We need to take a good history in terms of their symptoms and symptoms may uh, define a risk. We need to look into their family history because their family history may identify for us whether we're talking about a very sinister, malignant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a more benign condition. Physical examination offers very little, as uh, Professor Sharma said before. The 12-lead ECG can potentially help, 
And then we've got the transthoracic echocardiogram, the exercise test, and the ECG monitor, okay? For most conditions, having all that information will probably allow us to adequately assess the risk with the knowledge that we've got currently about the different conditions. Of course, there are more advanced investigations that we can do, like the cardiac MRI, and the cardiac MRI has exploded in terms of its use in cardiology. It is an expensive test. It is an expensive machine. Uh, the expertise are not available everywhere, but as far as the UK is concerned, we're actually doing pretty good about the availability of cardiac MRI. And what the cardiac MRI does that the other tests cannot really do is look within your heart muscle and try and look at that existence of scar uh, that may predispose to malignant arrhythmias. And of course, familial evaluation can be a clue in terms of uh, risk stratifying individuals. And then we've got genetic testing, which I will refer towards the end because it can be useful, but sometimes we overestimate its value in terms of risk stratifying individuals with cardiac conditions. And then in some individuals, it may be necessary to go to more advanced testing. And uh, some of my electrophysiology colleagues will know that uh, in some cases, a good example will be Brugada syndrome or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, putting catheters into people's heart and try and stimulate arrhythmias or map the electrical wiring may provide more information in terms of their overall risk of arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. So let's look at uh, the three examples I promised you. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is the condition that we've got the abnormal thickening. You've heard about it two, three times. Even if you didn't know anything about it, you probably become experts by now. What do we do with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? We look at history, okay? And we look at symptoms. And we also explore family history of premature sudden cardiac death. So young people who succumb to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or presumably succumb to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then we do the ultrasound scan of the heart and we look how thick is your heart, how big is the chamber called the atrium, and does it cause obstruction? Does it cause challenges for the heart to get the blood out of the chambers? Then we'll do the ECG monitor and the exercise test. Potentially the main thing we're looking for is for irregular heartbeat. So we look for arrhythmias, particularly arrhythmias coming from the bottom chambers, ventricular arrhythmias and coming together or for longer periods, okay? The exercise test, I use it a lot, to be honest with you, for young individuals because they will probably be physically active. They'll do exercise. I definitely do it for sportsmen. And it gives me an opportunity to assess what happens during exercise for that individual where the resting test will fail to do that. And then, as I said, cardiac MRI can be useful, but it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, and then what I'll do we do have calculators, okay? So this is free online hypertrophic cardiomyopathy risk stratification calculator. If you go to Google and put HCM risk calculator, it will come up for you. And you'll see that you'll have to input all the stuff that we just discussed. The age of the individual, how thick is the heart, how big is the atrium, what's the obstruction? Is there a family history of sudden cardiac death at a young age? Do they have arrhythmias in terms of ventricular tachycardia and have they experienced syncope before? And then the calculator will come with a number and he'll tell you that the uh, risk of this individual experiencing a significant arrhythmia that may predispose to cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death in five years is four, six, 10, 20%, okay? And then it will advise you whether a defibrillator, which is the special sort of pacemaker we use in order to save lives, should be implanted in order to offer that protection to the individual. So that's how it works. So we'll have the low-risk individuals. Again, important message to remember, when we say low-risk individual, we don't mean no risk. We roughly in cardiology mean that the risk is less than 1% per year, okay? So it's important to keep that in mind. And that goes back to the comment I made earlier about the perception of risk in different individuals. For all those individuals, we'll discuss lifestyle. We have medical therapies that we can use as necessary, predominantly depending on their symptoms and the presence of arrhythmia. 
We have surgical therapies if necessary, if the muscle is too thick and is causing problems, and obviously implement family screening of all first degree relatives. And it's such a great pity if you identify in your cardiology clinic someone who has a potentially inherited cardiac condition and you don't make sure that their first degree relatives get screened. Okay, those individuals have a 50 50 chance or almost a 50 50 chance of having the condition. So it's going to be a missed opportunity. And what we do, we reserve the defibrillators for those who are at the highest risk. So those who have more than 6% over five years. And obviously those individuals will also be people who have already significant arrhythmias or had a cardiac arrest. Very similar description for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. For arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, we've been learning more over the past decade. So we're progressing gradually, but again, similar sort of notion. Are they symptomatic? Are they experiencing syncope? Does the ultrasound scan shows a weak and buggy right ventricle that has already suffered a lot? Do we have any evidence of arrhythmia on the ECG monitor? And in some cases, electrophysiology studies, putting the catheters into people's heart may help with re-stratify them. And cardiac MRI can also be very useful in terms of assessing the extent of scar within the heart muscle. And now, even for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, again, we have developed a calculator, exactly the same notion, a bit weaker than the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy calculator because the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy calculator is based on identifying the risk of dying suddenly or having cardiac arrest, okay? This identifies the chances of having a significant arrhythmia, but not necessarily cardiac arrest, but still it's useful as a tool for clinical practice. And very similar to what I described before, you can re-stratify your patients depending on your findings. And then you can do your lifestyle, medical therapy as necessary, family screening, and you'll reserve the ICD for those who have or are considered to be at the highest possible risk. Okay, so that's how we work with those two conditions. Now, what is the role of genetic testing in re-stratification? It is fairly limited. Okay, I'll give you two or three examples. Genetic testing is predominantly used for what we call familial cascade screening. What does that mean? You identify a gene in one individual, and then you start screening their relatives for the same gene. And that's an extremely useful thing for genetic testing, and that's how we used it up till now. In some cases, it can help with diagnosis, prognostic, restratification, and even deciding on therapy and exercise recommendations. However, for most conditions, this remains the ultimate dream. So why are we so keen on genetic testing? Because we hope that in the future, it will help us individualize uh, treatment for patients, okay? But I have to admit that we're still at relatively infancy stage in terms of understanding our genetics and most genetic conditions. A nice example is the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy I mentioned earlier. And I'm mentioning that because we've got lots of concerns in terms of intense exercise in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. The heart has weak connections, particularly on the right side, which if they put under a lot of stress with regular endurance exercise, then that may expedite the expression of the condition and predispose to sudden cardiac death. So even if you're genotype positive, so you've got the gene, but you haven't quite expressed the condition or you have a mild form of the condition, then the advice in terms of exercise may be more conservative. So that's a good example. Dilated cardiomyopathy, very poor genetic yield. The yield of a positive gene test in dilated cardiomyopathy patients is not more than 20%, one in five, okay? However, there are certain patients, those who have a strong family history, or they've got issues with the electrical wiring of the heart, or they've got a lot of arrhythmia, that you may suspect a particular genetic condition called a laminopathy, okay? And we know, again, that those patients, if you identify someone with laminopathy, his prognosis, how well he'll do in the future, it's much different compared to the general dilated cardiomyopathy population. So if they do worse, you need to monitor them closely and consider potentially the implantation of a defibrillator at an earlier stage. 
Before I finish, I wanted to mention this condition, the long QT syndrome, because I think this condition exemplifies what we hope genetic testing may do for us in the future. Because long QT syndrome has a very high genetic yield. So out of 100 people that I'll test with a clinical suspicion, I may identify a gene in 80% of them, not 20 or 10 that I said earlier. It can help you with diagnosis. And now having a positive gene is enough to give you a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. And I'll show you how it can help with prognosis, even choosing the right treatment for the individual and the exercise recommendations. So very briefly, this is a complicated uh, graph, but what I want to highlight, you look long QT type one, type two, type three. Those are the three common genetic subtypes of long QT syndrome. And you can see if you look at the risk as light yellow, dark yellow, light green and dark green, that long QT3 is always a greater risk compared to long QT2 and long QT type 1, even if you look at the same ECG indices, okay? So knowing the genetic subtype of the long QT will inform the risk of that particular individual. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that the different long QT genes can predispose to sudden death and arrhythmia in different circumstances. For example, if you take the gene that is responsible for long QT type 1, they get arrhythmias predominantly during exercise. They're also very prone to arrhythmias when they swim or dive into cold water. So you need to keep that in mind because in long QT type 3, they predominantly get arrhythmias during rest. So if you've got an athlete who has long QT type 3, you may be more comfortable with them exercising. If you've got a swimmer who has long QT type 1, you need to provide the appropriate advice and be very cautious with it. So in conclusion, restratification is possible in most inherited cardiac conditions. In some, we're better than others. We need to take a systematic approach and I will recommend in expert centers. Simple tools are the cornerstone for the time being of restratification and increasing utility of genetic testing and also be aware of the limitations in your discussions with patients in terms of how they perceive risk and the data you've got and the knowledge that we still don't have and the uncertainty that we're facing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Um, the next talk, um, one which often comes up with families who are in the system is around how often patients with cardiac conditions should be tested and retested. Uh, over to that's Sanjay Sean. Thank you very much. It's me again. Um, some of what I'm going to tell you today is not necessarily completely textbook. Uh, it's based on my clinical practice, although clearly I, I, I follow guidelines. And these guidelines, you know, vary from one physician to another. But it's, it's a very important question, and it really made me think when I was making my slides yesterday about how we practice things. So the objectives of my talk were to dis are to describe factors which govern the frequency of assessment in individuals with established inherited cardiac disease, to discuss the age at which we start addressing individuals or screening individuals with a history of inherited cardiac conditions, to discuss the frequency with which we should be assessing these individuals with inherited cardiac conditions, and then to discuss when and how often we should screen athletes and the young general population. I wanted to include the athletes and the young general population because it's the ethos of CRY to focus on preventing young sudden cardiac death in the nation, not just in selected groups. But what factors would govern decisions relating to follow-up care in people with inherited cardiac conditions? Well, clearly the symptomatic status, the more symptomatic a patient, the more likely that I want to see them frequently, especially if there are plans uh, or a strategy in place to escalate therapy. The risk profile of the individual, Michael's already alluded to the fact that we, we can work out low risk versus intermediate risk, and we certainly can work out high risk individuals. The risk profile of the individual will govern how frequently we see them. The disease process itself, some diseases are more stable than others. And of course, the demographics of the individual, by that I mean the age, their athletic status, their occupation, all of these things will determine how often I see them. 
I should remind you all that the diseases that we're talking about are very heterogeneous in the way they present in their natural history and often in the way that they actually respond to treatment. So no size fits all with inherited cardiac conditions. And we need to be completely aware of that. And I will highlight that with the natural history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So at the bottom here, you see the age ranges, and I'm going to show you the various um, trajectories that an individual with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can take. So you might find that they develop, they're, they're, very, they're asymptomatic until they get into their fifth and sixth decade, and then they start developing progressive symptoms, but die at a ripe old age of 80 something uh, from either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, something related or something not related at all. The second trajectory is that these people don't develop left ventricular hypertrophy until their 50s and have very minimal symptoms even before they die. Then we've got the third trajectory where people start running into trouble in their sixth decade with atrial fibrillation, heart failure, and stroke. And the thing that we fear the most about cardiomyopathies is that some people may develop left ventricular hypertrophy during adolescence and early adulthood and die suddenly. And these are the ones that really capture our heart. So the adolescent group is a group that's particularly vulnerable and a group that we assess more frequently than the adult population. And here's some more data on sudden death in young sports people, because we learn a lot about what goes on in young people through sports people. These are data on nearly 1900 sudden cardiac deaths sudden deaths of which over a thousand were thought to be cardiac. And if you look at the age group of these individuals, the average age was 18 years old. And uh, you can see that they're the main, mainly males. So I, I worry mainly about adolescent males. There's good evidence that these individuals are more at risk than others. So the next question is, when do we start screening individuals with a family history of inherited cardiac disease? So you've got, a, you've got two anxious parents, one of them has got a cardiac disease and they've got four children and they're saying, look, is my kid has now started playing rugby. I want this kid tested. And these diseases vary in when they manifest in how quickly you can diagnose them. So this is, again, my own personal experience. You'll see that I'll show you the age at the bottom and the onset of disease. So things like long QT syndrome, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, these are ion channel diseases, manifest early in life, usually in the first 10 years of life, maybe the first 10, 15 years. And you can diagnose those, particularly in symptomatic people, but you can also pick up a long QT interval in a six or seven year old. The cardiomyopathies, things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may not start showing until late adolescence and adulthood. In my experience, ARVC shows even later than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Brugada patients often present with an adverse event in their third or fourth or fifth decade. And dilated cardiomyopathy patients usually present a bit later on compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So this is the age group that they present at generally. So the tests that we perform, Michael's already done my homework for me. If it's an electrical disorder, we've got a variety of tests that are available to us to uh, investigate these people. If it's a structural condition such as cardiomyopathy, we've got imaging tests, but we've got the role of exercise tests and prolonged ECG monitors to risk stratify these people. So how often do you test? So, so, so this is important. You know, We are facing a situation where our patients, we are accruing patients. So this year, I will have more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients than I had last year. Next year, I'll have even more. And the year after, I've even more. And there's only one of me and one of Michael. And the NHS will not allow us to keep employing consultants until our clinics are bursting at the seams. So we've got to start becoming more realistic about how frequently we can see these people. So clearly to do that, we've got to identify who we consider high risk, who we consider intermediate risk, and who are low risk. And this is my opinion, that children, adolescents, and athletes with established disease are probably the high risk individuals and we are worried about them you're not just worried about them you're worried about their parents as well who are petrified about their kids developing a phenotype they're still growing we don't know what they're going to develop in you know five or six years on so we see them far more frequently clearly highly symptomatic patients patients with cardiomyopathy with a high risk profile such as arvc 
the laminopathies, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a high five-year risk, uh, people with amyloid cardiomyopathy. These are the sort of people we'll see more frequently, probably six monthly. People with long QT syndrome have got QT intervals of more than 500, particularly if the genotype suggests LQT2 or LQT3. Then we've got the intermediate risk. These are cardiomyopathy patients with an intermediate risk profile. Then we've got low risk individuals. These are minimally symptomatic people with a low risk profile. People who are gene positive, phenotype negative. People with things like the concealed form of Brugada syndrome. These people probably now, I think since COVID, we've started to see them. We used to see them annually. We've, we've changed it to two yearly because we've got the uh, liberty of telephone consults just to make sure they are all right. We want to drag them all over to us to do tests on them. So that's the situation with our disease processes. But what about people with, what about athletes without cardiac disease? So most athletes are apparently well. And I alluded to uh, something that we've done with the FA. I told you that we've tested 11,000 old athletes uh, and we followed these people up for 11 years. And in those 11 years, there were around 30, uh, 23 old deaths, deaths of all, from all causes, of which eight were cardiac. So 35% of these screened adolescent athletes died from a cardiac condition. The, the incidence there is one in 14,700. That's far higher than most um, papers that you read. And these are the things that they died from. You will see that the vast majority, I think seven out of eight, died from a cardiomyopathy. And you'll start asking me, but you guys did this test, uh, tested these FA player, FA kids with ECG and echo, and still eight people died. And worse still, we only picked up two of them. So we missed 75% of people that died when we tested them at the age of 16. And there are two ways to interpret this data. Either that screening is a complete waste of time, or that a one-off screen does not pick up something. So if, you, if you're going to test a young man, a young boy at the age of 15 or 16, who's destined to develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the future, you may not see that until they're 23 years old. And when we look at the time lag between the screening program and the death, it was seven years. Most of these people died about seven years after they had been tested. And what this tells us is that a one-off screen in an adolescent is not enough because some diseases have incomplete expressions and don't show themselves until later. And the Italian data showed this. This is an 11 year experience of athletic, of screening adolescent athletes, 15,000 odd consecutive athletes screened between the age of 12 and 18 years. And during this 11 year period, they had a mean of around four screens in this time period. They noted, just like we have done, about 0.3 to 0.4% of their athletes had serious cardiac diseases, as highlighted there, mainly cardiomyopathies, ion channel disease, or myocardial scar. And then this slide here, the dark bar, the dark blue bar shows you the diagnostic yield during the first screen, and the light blue bars shows you the additional diagnostic yield during subsequent repeat screens. And what they showed was that serial screenings during this period increased the diagnostic risk, uh, the diagnostic uh, yield by about threefold. So when it came to young athletes, we changed our guidelines with the FA. In, initially, it was a compulsory history examination and echo at the age of 16 years old. But we realized that wasn't adequate. We've now changed it to two yearly assessments at the age of 18, 20, and 22-year-olds in, in these, in these uh, players. And what happens after that we normally recommend two early assessments, but then we leave that to the club. So what about the general population? Because not everyone is an athlete. We've got so many young individuals in this country who may be harboring these, in, uh, these conditions. When do we start screening? If we are going to do any screening, what age are we going to start? Do we start at five, six, seven, nine, ten? And our view has already collectively always been that we start at around 14 years old. And you say, well, why 14? Why not 11? Well, this is the reason. This ECG here shows a juvenile ECG pattern where you see T-wave inversion in V2 and V3, which is common in young children. But this ECG pattern can also reflect the possibility of underlying arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So you imagine telling a parent that your 11-year-old kid has got a funny-looking ECG 
which is probably nothing, but can be ARVC. Those parents are going to be petrified for, for the next five or six years. So we've become a bit more realistic because when we look at the prevalence of T-wave inversion in people aged under 14 years old, it's nearly 10%. But after the age of 14, it drops dramatically to 1.4%. And after 16, it drops to 0.2%. So we start screening at the age of 14. These false worries that we give parents go down considerably. And then it, clearly, if you see the odd one at, with T-wave inversion, say, so you know what, we're not worried yet. We'll do this again at the age of 16. If they persist at the age of 16, we will then go on to test them. The second thing I've already alluded to is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will not necessarily show below the age of 14 years old. And this data set shows exactly this. These are, this is data from 285 gene positive phenotype individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, they, the median age was 14 and they were, they were screened for 15 years. And they found over 15 years, the diagnostic yield was about 46, 46% 46 of these people developed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in 15 years. But by the time that they were about 19 years old, only 10% of those people had actually shown, direct, shown evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we normally start late with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But I think the message here is that just because you haven't excluded hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the age of 18 or 19, it's not important. You shouldn't reassure the person that they'll never develop this condition. So the CRI screening program um, uh, evaluated, I've already told you about this, evaluated 104,000 odd people. They found one in 300 people had a serious cardiac condition. I already told you that 37% of these people received important treatment. But despite our screening program, we have had deaths. And what this data tells us is that a normal ECG does not mean nothing will happen to you. But we've got to work out what did these people actually die of? And this great data uh, that was uh, basically led by Michael and, his, and our research fellow, Hamish, if we actually look at the deaths, these 36 deaths, we found that the leading pie charts here were SAD, sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So we, our ECGs are still not good at picking up people who are going to go on to develop things like ARVC and SADs. Now, I want to just leave you with my own theory about SADS. I don't think all SADS is genetic. It can't be. Uh, otherwise, we'd be finding it in everyone. I think some SADS is very, very, very bad luck. We all get ectopics, all of us. If we did a 24-hour tape, you'll all get an ectopic. Sometimes the ectopic, especially during a very slow heart rate, falls at a very wrong time on the cardiac cycle. And my feeling is that some of these deaths that you see at night are r on t phenomenon, putting people into ventricular fibrillation, which is one reason why we don't find an underlying cause in everyone. And I think there we've got to advise some of our youth about caffeinated drinks, illicit drugs, being ripped in the gym with anabolic steroids. These are the sort of things that we're promoting some causes of science. So in conclusion, the frequency of um, Testing young patients with inherited cardiac conditions is governed by symptomatic status, risk profile, and age. Screening may occur, may occur early in childhood for long QT and CPVT. However, the prevalence of cardiomyopathy is low until late adolescence and early adulthood. Therefore, screening may be deferred until the age of 14 in the absence of symptoms. Among young adolescent individuals in the general population, a normal screen during adolescence and early adulthood does not exclude the potential for genetic cardiac diseases, particularly cardiac. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now invite uh, Michael back to the next uh, talk, which is talking about quality of life and uh, once a young person is identified. Five minutes. Thanks, Michael. I promise it's the last time you're going to hear from me. So don't despair. So uh, the question I was asked to address is how can patients live well after a diagnosis of an inherited cardiac condition? Uh, I'll try and address some of the needs of patients. I'm not going to claim that I know all the needs of the patients or I can address all of them. And again, the message of the multidisciplinary team comes here. 
And I will focus a bit on the thing that I'm a bit more passionate about, the exercise and physical activity with inherited cardiac conditions. And I'll also give you an example of a very nice study that we performed uh, with uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So as I said, multidisciplinary approach comes again and again and again when dealing with inherited cardiac conditions and it couldn't be more true for individuals who get diagnosed with a condition. It's important to remember that a lot of the time you've got a, a young individual who is fit and well, who does lots of exercise, he has next to zero symptoms, and then he realized that actually he's got an issue with the heart, and uh, that completely changes the life. It creates a lot of challenges as well, because you know, if you got your arm amputated, people will see, they will recognize, they will sympathize with it. If you look very healthy, but inside there is a big issue with the heart, then that creates a number of different issues uh, that uh, in general people, but particularly young, young individuals and particularly young males in my experience cannot quite deal with and creates a lot of challenges. So the point I wanted to make is that, yes, the cardiologist plays an important role in providing that support to the individual with a diagnosis, but we rely a lot in our nurses and most in health cardiac conditions clinic in specialized centers like our center, we rely heavily on a group of five nurses that support the five consultants who are the cornerstone of uh, communicating with uh, our patients and providing the necessary support. The other things that unfortunately were lacking a lot of the time within the national health system, and we've discussed that on a number of occasions, Steve, is uh, counselors, is the provision of psychologists, people who can actually provide support for those individuals who have a new diagnosis. Uh, and that's where support groups like the My Heart group that cries running or other support groups that other charities are can come into effect because essentially you create a network of individuals who have uh, conditions, similar experiences. You've got the individuals who have been through that route, through that experience and are able to provide some support to individuals who are coming new with a diagnosis of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy requires in defibrillator, for example. And that that that's very unique and that's very important because that's not something that me as a cardiologist can provide um, to those patients. And of course, we shouldn't forget the role that the general practitioners, the family doctors um, uh, play, because at the end of the day, those are the people who knew the individual beforehand. They And they will continue to managing in the long term. And they will need to support those patients and they will require support from us in terms of supporting their uh, patients. Now, uh, the other important thing is that that support that you're going to provide, it needs to be individualized. So everyone is different and everyone will have different needs, which will be dictated as well in terms of from their age, from their gender, from their experience in life and their perception in terms of their condition and how they can live with it. And it's important also to highlight that that support uh, changes over time, particularly if you've got someone who gets diagnosed in a young age, there are different needs at the age of 16, different needs at the age of 26, different needs at the age of 36 and different needs at the age of 50 and 60. Now, the important thing is that we take a holistic approach to supporting those patients. And I think it's very challenging to find the right balance between having a young individual that you really make him feel like a patient for the rest of his life compared to them ignoring the condition and uh, uh, the precautions that they need to take in order to be able to live a fulfilling life to its full. And again, living a normal life versus making the necessary ad adjustment to have that uh, fulfilling life uh, that goes into the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, in order to provide that holistic approach, we need to consider people make, you need to provide support because there may be questions about the condition itself. And that's something that a cardiologist can do. But then people will have lots of questions in terms of their work. Can I continue doing that physical job I was doing before? How do I communicate my condition to my occupational health department? Because I look healthy, they don't understand what's going on for me. They're not keen to give me some leave in order to be able to adjust to the new reality. 
uh, support and communication with the family in terms of how they can support uh, their, their loved one who has a condition and how they can be supported as well in order to manage uh, that new reality. They can have questions about uh, sex, about uh, exercise, about other activities. So there will be a number of different things and that will be quite unique to every individual. And we just need to take that into account. Now, if I focus on exercise, just to highlight you how challenging things have been in terms of uh, exercise, uh, we as cardiologists we have always been very concerned about exercise. So we've got that theory that, you know, and it makes sense to some extent that if you've got a heart that is structurally and electrically abnormal, and you go and load that heart with the exercise, and you increase the adrenaline surges in your body, then that heart may be predisposed to irregular heartbeats, ventricular tachycardia, cardiac arrest, and sudden cardiac death. And that has always been at the back of our mind. And that has dictated essentially the recommendations that we produced as cardiologists in terms of how much exercise people should be doing if they've got an underlying cardiac condition. And large part of it is those inherited cardiac conditions, the cardiomyopathies and nine channelopathies. And here I've got for you a number of different sports, okay, that you can read, which have different demands on the heart. Uh, and the point I was trying to make is that if you go and read those old recommendations that we're producing up to 2020, what do you think people can do? Most can do that. So if you were following the advice as a young individual who was playing football, you realize suddenly that I was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and I can do billiards, bowling, curling, golf, riflery, uh, no insult to cricket. Actually, they have moved cricket out of this category, so you couldn't even do cricket now. So we have been extremely, extremely limiting in terms of what we advise and what we uh, allow uh, individuals to do in terms of physical activity and uh, sports. And as you realize, that can be very devastating uh, for a particularly a younger individual. And not only that, but I can confess to you and your medical, my medical colleagues in here will know that is that in terms of our training in medical school or during the cardiology training, I can't even remember if we discussed physical exercise. I can't even remember if we discussed cardiac rehabilitation, so on and so forth. So in terms of our knowledge of exercise prescription and advising people how much they can do, we've got very limited knowledge. We're very good at sticking stents in people's arteries or putting the defibrillator in. But in terms of advising them about lifestyle and exercise, we're really bad at it because we really had very limited teaching. So I can confirm to you that I think for most of my colleagues, the dreaded question after having a clinical consultation with a young individual at the end of the consultation is whether they will ask them whether they can do any exercise and what physical activity they can engage in because most of us don't really have a good answer. Now, the challenge of that is that uh, uh, Professor Sharma has already referred in terms of how we can identify individuals who have underlying cardiac conditions, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reality is that uh, although screening may be controversial, the reality is that screening is expanding, okay? All the sporting bodies are doing screening in respect of what country you look at. CRI is screening more than 35,000 young individuals irrespective of physical activity within the United Kingdom. So screening is expanding and what that means obviously will identify more individuals. Also, we get better treatments. We're getting better at re-stratifying as we discussed earlier, individuals within head cardiac condition and we're getting better at treating them. And obviously, we start to get better even in what I call secondary prevention, emergency response planning. Once someone has a cardiac arrest, to have a plan, whether it's a stadium or a train station, as what's going to happen and get the defibrillator there quickly so they can survive their cardiac arrest and get appropriate diagnosis and treatment afterwards. So that essentially means that we're more likely to have a bigger population of younger individuals that get identified with an inherited condition. And most of them, remember, will be at low risk with mortality rates comparable to the general population, all right? And the last thing we want to do is convert those individuals to patients for the rest of their life. 
and take them away from physical activity and exercise that we know have significant benefits on all aspects, not only cardiovascular, in terms of cancer, in terms of mental health, so on and so forth. So in terms of how do we go about exercise prescription in individuals who may have an inherited cardiac condition, what we should ideally like to do and what we try to do in our clinic is take a very detailed history and establish the condition they've got. Uh, then look at how much exercise have they been doing up till now. Yes, okay, you do have the occasional individual that they did nothing and once they get diagnosed with hypomogenic cardiomyopathy, they decide to become elite cyclist. That can happen occasionally, but most people want to continue what they were doing before and find out what the intent level of exercise is. Then you can perform your evaluation uh, with a different test that we we'll mentioned during the day, and then hopefully provide an individualized exercise prescription. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Now, this is a very useful document for all medics in this uh, room or uh, online. Have a look at it. These are the 2020 AC guidelines on sports cardiology and exercise in patients with cardiovascular disease, led by Professor Sharma. This is essentially the European uh, collaboration, the European guidelines. And although it is a big document, what you have to do is you have to grasp the basic principles and then go to the condition you're looking for, and then you'll find the advice that you're looking for in order to provide that advice to your patient. And it's a very structured approach. It addresses exercise across different levels, from someone who wants to do physical activity to someone who is an elite football player. It's not only for elite athletes, and that's the important strength of the document. And very importantly, it does what I said before. It takes into account our limitations in terms of the data we've got and the knowledge we have for stratifying individuals and the impact of exercise and it takes into consideration the athlete's wishes and tries to balance risk versus benefit for exercise prescription in order to help them eventually achieve their goals. Now, what I wanted to show you briefly is this study that we designed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the classic, absolute classic condition that we were very, very concerned about exercise that can predispose to sudden cardiac death. You've seen in my slide, and Professor Sharma also saw you, that if you look at the American registry of sudden cardiac death, it's one of the main causes in their athletic individuals. So we've been very worried about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. However, gradually, we get to understand that actually people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can do exercise and they can potentially even do high intensity exercise. It's about doing that individualized assessment and giving that individualized prescription. Because at the end of the day, we have to remember that in our clinics, in our general population, the most of our patients are not elite athletes. They're regular individuals who want to do exercise for cardiovascular health and for cardiovascular uh, fitness. So what we try to do with this study, although there are other studies out there that have some benefit of cardiac rehabilitation program, what we said is based on the thought that we're identifying younger people, we said, let's try and concentrate on a younger cohort. So we got 16 to 60 years. We didn't go above that. And we also said, well, younger people are more likely to be stimulated by more high intensity exercise. So we don't want low moderate intensity. And we went to high intensity as defined here. And what we wanted to find out is, is such a program feasible, even within the national health system? Uh, is it safe? And does it improve things? similar to what it will do in patients who don't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in terms of their fitness, in terms of their quality of life, and in terms of the regular risk factors, blood pressure, cholesterol, blood glucose handling of your body. So what we do it is we got 80 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we randomized them into two groups. One group was the exercise group that they had a cardiac rehabilitation program, an exercise program essentially, which was supervised for 12 weeks compared to 40 individuals who got the regular NHS treatment in terms of exercise, which to be completely honest with you, it's not much. 
So what we did, we designed a, a very, very individualized exercise program. So we take into account uh, what's your baseline fitness level, because not everyone can do the same. Also, the fitness level in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will depend on the severity of the condition. If you've got obstruction, you won't be able to do as much as someone who has a mild form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we designed sessions that we split into three different levels, and people could progress the same exercise from level one, gradually to level two, gradually to level three, if they could do that. We had lots of different exercises, but we have very intense monitoring as well because we were very keen to ensure that we didn't increase the number or incidence of arrhythmias. And obviously, the last thing we wanted is to cause an episode of syncope or a sudden cardiac death in a young individual. What they did is they had two sessions in the hospital in our gym, and they had another session at home with their monitoring device. And the other thing that we missed, and that goes back to the holistic approach, is it's not just about the exercise. At the end of every session, we had a 30-minute session where we addressed issues that they wanted to discuss, whether that's uh, uh, an IC, their ICD, whether that's nutrition, whether it's uh, sex, whether it's driving, whatever. And that's a more comprehensive approach to cardiac rehabilitation as it should be. Now... I won't tell you the results, but the bottom line is that most patients did complete the study. So about 34 out of 40 in every group. Uh, so the feasibility was definitely there. In terms of cost, they were relatively the cost of a regular cardiac rehabilitation program that the NHS is run. We didn't have any evidence of increased arrhythmia. And very importantly, if you look at the different indices, you can see that patients who exercised with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so went through our program, they improved their overall cardiovascular fitness, so they were able to do more exercise, greater VO2, so on and so forth. To some extent, they also increased, sorry, improved the regular cardiovascular risk factors, the things that will get you the heart attack at your 50s and 60s. Blood pressure, no surprise, we know exercise helps with blood pressure. BMI came down and even the cholesterol improved a bit. And we also able to improve their anxiety and depression scores, going back to the holistic approach uh, in those individuals. So in terms of recreational exercise and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, really we've got enough evidence with that study and other studies that have been published that recreational exercise is uh, beneficial. And really, this minimum exercise recommendations that come from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and the World Health Organization should be your baseline, and you should have a very good reason to push an HCM patient beyond that baseline. So how do we go about assessing them? Roughly what I presented before, okay? History and physical examination, the ultrasound scan, the exercise test, very important if you're going to prescribe exercise. The ECG monitor, do your ECG monitor during training sessions, okay? There is no point of having an ECG monitor and tell them to relax for 24 hours. You want them to go and do the exercise that they wish to do potentially, because again, my lab doesn't necessarily recreate the conditions or the sport that they want to participate in. And then take an approach, as I said, safety versus the individual wishes, taking into account the ESC guidelines that we quoted uh, earlier. And I'll just leave that there because this is the sort of exercise prescription you should be thinking of as a doctor and as a cardiologist. So you need to address, go by the fit principle. So how often, what sport can they do? How long can they do it for? And also have a review date for them to reassess their exercise prescription, include some aerobic and include some strength training and give them options in terms of the sports that they can potentially do at different intensities, okay? You don't have to be particularly uh, advanced in terms of describing intensity. It can be as simple as you're out of breath or you're able to hold a comfortable conversation to detect intensity in terms of mild, moderate, or high, and your exercise test can guide you towards that. And then obviously don't forget once you've given your exercise prescription that you will require your regular monitoring and that will be dependent on 
the condition and on the individual. Uh, Professor Sharma highlighted, for example, that I'm more worried for a 16-year-old compared to a 60-year-old with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who exercises. And don't forget the advice, inform them what symptoms would they be looking for, okay? Inform them about getting keeping well hydrated, Caution with supplements, particularly supplements that don't know exactly what they contain, and great caution with uh, performance enhancing substances. And the last thing to say is that there needs to be an emergency response plan of some sort, particularly if you talk about high intensity exercise and organized activities within a sports arena, because if there is no organized emergency response plan, then there is no way that someone will be able to resuscitate that individual. If you go and look at the Fabrice Mamba and Christian Eriksen, they got saved because there was a plan there. They were there with a defibrillator within two or three minutes. And that's why they fully recovered with a no neurological deficit. So HCM and sports exercise will definitely go on for everyone. Whether they participate at very elite level, that's something that needs to be individualized. And again, needs to be individualized in expert centers. And for those medics around you who are interested in the subject of uh, ICC and sports cardiology, just a bit of advertisement in terms of the European Association of Preventive Cardiology, come and join us. And also, if you're very interested in sports cardiology, we even run an MSc that we teach exercise prescription in individuals with inherited cardiac conditions at St. George University of London. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. And uh, the final talker today, before we have um, some questions and answers, um, is with Sanjay looking at the new frontiers in treatment and uh, yeah, how treatments, medications, and heritage conditions are changing. Thank you. Well, I promise you this is the last time you'll hear from me today as well. So I've got, um, I mean, I wanted to be as optimistic as I possibly could about treatments for inherited cardiac conditions. That They are changing. There is certainly some light at the end of the tunnel. And I wanted to focus on a disease process, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but some of what I say will apply to other diseases as will become clear. So you know that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic condition that's due to mutations within sarcomeric contractile proteins. There are around 1400 mutations in 11 different genes, but 80% of these occur in myosin binding protein C and myosin, uh, myosin, myosin heavy chain. And the and, and what happens, the end result is left ventricular hypertrophy with a predisposition to fatal arrhythmias, which is usually highlighted in the public when a young athlete is affected. If we look at the pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's characterized by altered calcium kinetics, which causes a hyperdynamic contractile response, resulting in left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It's characterized by myocyte disarray and my myocardial fibrosis at molecular level, at, at histological level, and small vessel disease, all of which can result in ventricular arrhythmias. So the goals of managing patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is to phenotype them, so i.e. make the diagnosis properly, because some, some other conditions mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, such as um, storage disorders, sarcoid, amyloid, so you need to uh, phenotype these properly. You need to relieve symptoms, treat the arrhythmias, restratify them, we've already been through restratification, prevent sudden cardiac death, screen first degree relatives, genotype these people to facilitate cascade screening, and then of course continue to monitor them but clearly the main stay of treatment is to relieve symptoms because people come to see us because they've got lots of symptoms and they only start feeling well once you've alleviated those symptoms. So currently uh, we utilize pharmacotherapy uh, and this response to the physiological consequences of the disease. It has modest impact in most patients. You know, not, you know, most patients on pills feel a bit better, but not very much better. These pills, any of, any of you that look after cardiomyopathy patients, you'll tell me as well that these pills cause side effects in a lot of patients. They have no impact on the natural history of the disease. So if you put someone on a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, it's not going to stop the disease from getting worse and worse and worse with time. And they have no impact on progression of disease. And if we look at the management of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, for example, if someone's got symptoms, we put them on pills, 
these are beta blockers and verapamil. If they've still got symptoms, we add in dizapyramide. If they've still got symptoms, we either subject them to surgical therapy or transcoronary septal ablation. But it's important to remember that even things like uh, surgery in low volume centers, the mortality is, high, is as high as 16%. We also know that surgical therapy doesn't prevent progression because 26% of these people go on to develop new AF after they've had their myomectomy. And transcoronary septal ablation is complicated by AV block in 10 to 15% of patients. So we are in desperate need for new therapies to help treat this condition. And to do that, we need to understand what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy about? Well, at molecular level, what it does, it increases force generation within the left ventricle. And this is caused by an increased sodium influx and calcium availability, an increase in the myosin ATPase activity, conformational changes in myosin, the myosin head, an increased activation between myosin and actin, which causes a massive increase in force generation. And that increased contractility causes LVH and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It causes impaired relaxation. And because of this high energy input, there is also energy depletion causing adverse LV remodeling and scarring. So what we need to do is try and work on these mechanisms of disease process to deal with things. So what are the novel therapeutic targets in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, the, these could be targets that challenge the molecular derangements I've just talked to you about, increased sodium and calcium influx, actin mycin cross-bridging, and there are loads of drugs that we can use. I'm not going to go through all of those because I know not the whole, not everyone in the audience is an expert in inherited cardiac diseases, but just to give you an idea that there are drugs around that have been used, trialed and, and tried and tested, and I'll tell you what they've shown. But we know that it's a genetic derangement as well. So there is the possibility of gene replacement, gene editing, gene silencing. And when I started doing inherited cardiac conditions in 1997, I never imagined that a day would ever come that we could, we could actually one day cure this condition. We know that we can cure it now in mice and rats, and we're now starting to work on human beings as well. So let's talk about contemporary treatments that we could have used. So sodium ion channel blockers have failed. They didn't work. Angiotensin II receptor blockers haven't really worked in the adult population, although they did retard disease in gene-positive phenotype young children who were treated for a short period. Cardiac, cardiac mitotropes such as trimetazidine, perhexylene have been disappointing. And that brings me to myosin ATPase inhibitors and I'm going to talk about those in more detail now. These are, these are exciting drugs, and they will definitely be available in this country in a couple of months' time. So in order to understand how these drugs work, we've got to understand how, what actually goes on at molecular level when the heart contracts. So if you just focus down here, you will see that you've got this structure here, the myosin head, which is currently not interacting with, with, with the thin filament. So it binds something called ATP, and after, once ATP is bound, it's in, an, it's in a relaxed state. ATP is then, then broken down into ADP, and when that's broken down, it causes this myosin head to have an increase in energy, so it cogs upwards and makes contact with the myosin head. And as the ADP comes off, it generates force so that the thin filament slides over the thick filament, as you can see there. So that's what happens. It keep, you get this head going up, moving forward, down, up, moving forward, down. And then the whole process repeats itself. So we've got, we've got myosin kinase inhibitors. And what they do is they block this ATP hydrolysis, leaving the myosin head bound to just ATP. And by doing so, it means that more myosin is in a low energy state, i.e. in the state at the bottom. There's reduced contractility and there's improved myocardial relaxation. And again, initially, drugs were used in mice. They showed, they showed reduction in cell, cell shortening, 
and improved relaxation. Small animal studies in, showed that in pre-hypertrophic mice, uh, this treatment prevented left ventricular hypertrophy and reversed left ventricular wall thickness. Small studies in human beings also proved effective. And then came the big study called the Explorer HCM, which was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial that enrolled 251 patients, of which 72% were in NYHA2. So not very symptomatic, but slightly symptomatic. 123% of these people received this drug called Mavacemtan, and 128% received placebo. And these guys were followed up for 30 weeks. And the end point was either was an increase in peak oxygen consumption by 1.5 mils per minute per kilogram, an increase in NYHA functional class by one, or an increase in peak VO2 by three mils per minute per kilogram without any change in functional class, without any change in functional class or no worsening in functional class. That was the primary outcome. So with the drug, the primary outcome occurred in 37% of people taking the drug versus 17% of people who were not taking it. The post-exercise LVOT gradient reduced by 47 millimeters of mercury in people taking the drug versus 10 millimeters of mercury in people not taking the drug. The peak VO2 increased by 1.4 mils per minute per kilogram versus 0.1 mils per minute per kilogram. And the NYHA functional class improved in 65% of people taking the drug versus 31% who didn't take the drug. And the LV mass improved as well, as did the quality of life questionnaires. There were adverse events in around 8% of treated individuals, but that was no different versus the placebo group. So clearly, when you talk to a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or an inherited cardiac condition, the one thing that you want to know is that they feel better. So one of the markers of feeling better, better was this Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. And you see that the blue bars are those people that were treated, and the orange bars are those people that weren't treated. So matter, no matter how you look, whether you looked at physical limitation, social limitation, quality of life, people who took Mavacamptan were doing much, much better by nine points compared to people who weren't. We all, that this, a sub-study also showed that, that, that there was improved relaxation of heart muscle and a reduction in, in, in left atrial volume index. Now, one of the criticisms of Ex Explorer was that they only use very mildly symptomatic individuals. You know, most people were in NYHA2. And so they needed to use, uh, 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 do a study in people who were quite symptomatic. So this then came this second study where people were either in NYHA3 or 4. These are people that actually needed an operation or some other invasive treatment to help them be get better. Relatively small study, 56 patients were treated with the drug, 56 patients were on, on, on placebo. And what this trial showed was that the number of people that were eligible for surgery, i.e. these people were waiting for a surgeon to operate on them, once they went on this drug, the number of people that would have required an operation went down to, uh, to 18%. So from 100% to 18%, whereas people who weren't taking the drug, 77% of people were still at the level that they needed surgery. The improvement in NYHA functional class was quite great, 63% in people taking the drug versus 21% who weren't taking the drug. And the resting outflow tract gradient dropped to 14 millimeters of mercury in people taking the drug versus 46 millimeters of mercury in people who didn't take the drug. And so did the gradient improve after Valsalva maneuvers, and so did quality of life improvement. So most people got better. The only thing that we have to remember and we have to be realistic is that 37% of people who took this drug showed no benefit at all. So where does this drug stand now? We've got beta blockers, where the percentage of people with a left ventricular output tract gradient, or even after beta blockade, is high, 88%. If you add in diacepiramide, it's 60%. If you add in mavacamten, that goes down to 43%. Clearly not as good as surgery, but could prevent so many people from having an operation if this drug became available. And if it did become available, it would probably feature somewhere around here that if diacepiramide fails, you can add in something else. You can give our patients some more hope uh, before you subject them to surgery. So we're all very excited to get these drugs. But before we get very excited, we've also got to be aware that this drug, it, it, by, 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 just by virtue of its mode of action, it reduces LV function. It can sometimes cause arrhythmias. We need more data. We don't know about the long-term effects of these drugs. We don't know much about drug interactions. 
What about the effect of ethnic variation? These drugs have not been used in black people. What about the effect in children? Children were never used in these trials. Impact on advanced disease. The effect of non-sarcomeric HCM. The cost effectiveness, is it gonna prove cost effective? And the role in non-obstructive HCM. So with all these questions to answer, we need to be looking beyond pharmacotherapy. And that brings me to the last bit of my talk, which is gonna be short, gene therapy. So if you imagine you've got a gene that's defective and someone said to you, you know what, why don't we put the new gene into your heart muscle cell and get it working so that your heart muscle starts working properly? Or if you've got a gene that's overactive and causing trouble for your heart, how about saying, why don't we put something into your heart that destroys that gene and stops it from working very hard? So that's what the whole role of gene therapy is. Gene insertion for mutations where there is loss of function, so you get gene gain. Gene silencing for mutations where there is gain in function or gene editing. So how do we get this gene into your heart muscle? Well, what we use, we use viral packaging. So you put that you get this synthetic gene that is that's made in the laboratory, stick it in a virus. The virus then transmits this gene into the heart muscle cell. And this, this gene then starts producing protein, uh, which may replace the defective protein. And at the moment, we use adeno-associated virus vectors, uh, and these have been effective in replacing mycin binding protein C losses. They can also silence certain genes. But the problem with this is that obviously the body sees the viral capsid as a foreign object and will start developing neutralizing antibodies. The great thing is that this virus, that this, this, this stuff that we put in through this virus, this virus doesn't integrate into the human DNA, so it doesn't cause trouble, but its effects will wear out with time. So you would have to give people therapy every six months or so. But that's no different to what we're doing now with treatments such as Inclisiran to treat people's hypercholesterolemia. You give them six monthly injections and you keep the doctor away. The one problem about viral capsid factors is they cannot hold big information. They cannot transmit very, very big genes. So how do we get around very, very big genes? Well, you can use gene silencing therapy where big DNA is what DNA does. It produces mRNA, which is much, much smaller. And it's the mRNA that produces the protein. So we synthesize mRNAs that are defective they don't actually, they go and interfere with the bad mRNAs and stop them from doing their job. So if you've got a bad mRNA producing bad protein, if you, if you introduce in an mRNA that inhibits the function of that, you can stop it from working. That's another way of doing it. But for me, I think the most exciting thing is this thing called CRISPR, the use of clustered regulating interspersed palindromic repeat sequences. To make it very, very simple, bacteria contain equipment, ammunition. So when a, when a bacterium is invaded by a virus, the bacterium has apparatus that goes in and destroys the DNA of the virus. These are like scissors that chop genes. So what we can do is we can use this scissor that breaks up bad DNA. And we do that by introducing this thing, this CRISPR protein, we add to that an mRNA sequence that targets us to exactly where we want to go in that bad gene. So this gene, so this CRISP, CRISP uh, sequence is then brought to this bad gene. The bad gene is then clipped and then the clipped gene joins up. So you get rid of bad genes like that. Or you may introduce a mutation to shut the bad gene up. This gene, this study, what they took, they took a man who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, myosin binding protein C. They took his sperm with the bad gene. They mucked about with the sperm and they did in vitro fertilized fertilization. They created, I think, six embryos. None of them had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the worrying thing about this was that we don't know where this CRISPR will act elsewhere as well and whether it will cause bad problems to other parts of the DNA. So as a result of that, it's currently ethically incorrect to use this technology 
prior to IVF, but how impressive is that, that, you know, you created children that did not have the disease. So this is what is in line for us in the future, I think. Maybe not in my time, maybe in my time, but certainly in many of your times, you will find that we will be able to cure conditions like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy that I would have never imagined in 1997. So that's gene editing for you. So in consequence, uh, in conclusion, over the past two decades, there have been some exciting developments in the therapeutic advances of managing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most have failed, but Mavacamtan looks good. Targeting disease mechanisms holds promise for additional therapies, some of which will be genotype dependent. More exciting is the concept of gene therapy and gene editing, which really has a potential for cure in the future. Thank you very much. So we've had quite a few questions online, um, but also, um, first of all, if we throw that out to the, um, the audience in case if you have any questions which you'd like to ask the panel. Is there any data on the resuscitation of the other athletes out in the field? Is that? Yes, that's right. Sorry, I haven't got my hearing aid in, but they're going to give you a mic now. Oh, right. <laughs> um, I think it's called cardio commodus. Okay. Yeah, um, what's, what's the sort of percentage chances of uh, resuscitating someone in that uh, situation, provided you got an AED um, on hand straight away? Okay, so the question was, uh, you know, th th this thing called commotion of cordis. Uh, what are the chances of actually fixing someone who's at commotion of cordis if you've got an AED in, in, in presence? So for those of you that don't know what commotion of is, cordis is, it's, it's basically a situation where, the, where an individual is struck by a high projectile object, such as an ice hockey puck, a cricket ball, or something like that, right under the uh, left nipple. At, at a very vulnerable point of the cardiac cycle, which then puts the heart into ventricular fibrillation. It's something that usually occurs in children who have got very compliant chest walls uh, and can cause a sudden death. But the, the important thing to remember is that the arrhythmia that causes this problem is VF. And if you're going to have a cardiac arrest, the thing to have is VF because that's got the best outcome. So my response to that is if you've got, gone into VF due to commotion cordis, and someone shocks you out of that very quickly, your outlook would be good. I, I think the important thing to highlight is that irrespective of the condition that caused the cardiac arrest, the key is early resuscitation and early defibrillation, whether that's commotion cordis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or coronary artery disease. So Training is important in terms of educating everyone, in terms of basic life support to go there and start recognize the cardiac arrest and start CPR early. And then the next important step is for the AED, the automated external defibrillator, to arrive early and definitely within five minutes. Once the five, maximum 10 minutes is gone, then the chances of recovering, surviving that cardiac arrest or at least recovering, having a meaningful recovery, because it's not only to survive it, but to have a quality of life. Once you have survived that cardiac arrest, drops significantly. If you look at studies, it becomes very evident that if you manage those things, quick resuscitation, quick defibrillation, then the resuscitation, successful resuscitation rates of individuals with discharge from the hospital with minimal or no neurological issues can be up to 80%, but it's doing it quickly. On the other hand, there are studies that they start resuscitation after 10 minutes and defibrillation 10, 15 minutes, and the survival rate was 16%. 
So it all comes to that. But of course, it's important to note that, you know, the thing with commotio cortis is that you essentially have a structurally normal heart. So if you get to defibrillate them early, the likelihood is that they will have a complete recovery. Okay. Any further questions? First of all, may I thank the panel? I think it's an absolutely fantastic session. And I think all of you are super experts. And I think I, I can see clearly from what you've pre uh, presented as data, it's obviously it's lifetime work for some of you. So I think congratulations to that and congratulations to CRY for actually putting this together as part of Medicine and Me. So my question is really pushing the boundaries for the future, Mary. It's to you really to start with. I can see that there's great data that um, the team has come together with the research and obviously the work that you've done. What I can see is that there's almost a need for a biobank um, um, within the pathology system to actually have um, uh, the tissue there that can be used, not just now, but in the future as well, as we get further data um, and get further techniques, but also a way to actually hold the expertise of the colleagues here um, linked to that biobank of good practice, which can be shared, not just in England or the UK, but internationally. So that's a, quite a big question, but it'd be quite nice to start maybe with you, Mary, and the rest of the team. Thank you very much. I think it highlights, we get consent for research and retention in one third of our cases. Now we're going up to 50% now. Each year, more and more families are consenting for developing what we think is effectively a biobank. But you're absolutely right. We don't have a national program for all cases to have material, both the genetic and the cardiac tissue as well. So you're absolutely right. We need to develop the infrastructure for biobanking and the funding for that. Obviously, we cry another other and the NHS to tell all pathologists with every sudden that this is what you take. You can consent to family and appropriate consenting and expertise. And to share that, you're right, internationally, because the autopsy rate in other countries, getting the material is appalling. Some countries with absolutely no results in sudden cardiac death because they don't carry out any autopsies. And what I'll say, and probably answers a question which was online as well, is the use of imaging in autopsy. I'm afraid imaging is useless for cardiac disease. It won't tell you you have a normal heart. At the moment, it won't tell you you have an abnormal heart. Yes, I think imaging and scanning may occur, but it's a long, long way away. So we still need the autopsy. We need the tissue. We need the genetic material, both nationally and to compare internationally. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Mary, a question for you. Just did you find on that note that during the COVID pandemic there was a, a reduction in the in, in the sort of referrals that you got and the, the specimens that were sent and collections? Because some yeah. turned to the virtual, the scanning, didn't they? Too. Yes, the, the, there has been an increase in scanning. Scanning is quite good when you've got trauma, when you've got subarachnoid brain, subarachnoid hemorrhages, but for cardiac disease at this moment. Scanning will not replace it, and the majority of sudden deaths are still due to cardiac disease. So that a scan will not answer the question for you. Concerning the pandemic, we didn't see a reduction in referrals. We kept up, Joe and I kept up our practice. We stayed open. We managed to do it with obeying all the rules like Johnson. <laughs> so we did continue. The interesting part, we did not see an increase in inflammation in the heart, myocarditis, related to the virus, we saw no increase in myocarditis or even an overall increase in sudden cardiac death itself during the pandemic. Interesting. Thank you. We, we, we frequently get cases following scans as well. So if they don't find a cause or they think that there might be something wrong with the heart, they then will do a limited autopsy and take the heart and it gets referred to us as well. So we got that so in our case mix as well. One of the questions really follow on similar, but it's slightly different is how do how can viruses that can affect the respiratory 
aspects of the body like the flu, COVID-19, affect patients at risk with sudden cardiac death or patients with an inherited cardiac condition? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I mean, viruses can can definitely affect individuals. As individuals who have inherited cardiac conditions may occasionally be more prone in in what way? In a way that uh, if you've got a heart that has already some injury in terms of myocardial fibrosis and that heart gets inflamed, then it may be more prone to arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. But o overall. Uh, and that comes back to the question again about the COVID-19 pandemic. We, we were very worried. We were very cautious with our ICC patients, but I can't honestly say that we saw anything uh, uh, out of the ordinary in terms of uh, patients presenting with more arrhythmia, with more myocarditis, or with more cardiac arrest. I should add, for those of you listening online, is that uh, what has come out of something that this question is that people with inherited cardiac conditions should be wary when they have viral infections because there are certain conditions, the Brugada syndrome, for example, if you spike in very high temperatures, you could go into ventricular fibrillation. So this is the advice that we do give people with Brugada is to treat febrile episodes. And the second thing is for people with long QT syndrome with respiratory tract infections is to always be aware of antibiotics that probably one should not take, especially for people who are penicillin allergic, um, need to make sure that your GP is aware that you're not to be taking drugs like clarithromycin and azithromycin, which could cause a sudden cardiac death. Well, I'm sure you're not prescribing clarithromycin for viral infections. <laughs> no, but do you agree that viral infections can become bacterial, so. Fantastic, do we have any more questions? There's still quite a few. Um, online. Uh, um, so in syncope, syncope patients with palpitations, what additional features, including in family history, should prompt an ECG analysis for Brugada syndrome? In syncope patients with pal palpitation? Yeah. Well, I think the, the first thing is that anyone with syncope should have a, an ECG, and those are guidelines. Uh, anyone who's had a transient loss of consciousness should have a 12 lead ECG. That, that is, that's not my opinion, that is, that is guideline. And uh, so anyone attending A&E with a transient loss of consciousness should not leave the A&E without a 12 lead ECG. Uh, the 12 lead ECG will certainly um, exclude overt Brugada syndrome, uh, but may not exclude the concealed form. But in that situation, I think one needs to then do further investigations uh, to see what, what, what comes up and take a more detailed family history. So in short, everyone with transient loss of consciousness should have an ECG. Fantastic. Um, the question here relating to the, the talk, um, oh, sorry, the screen just moved around. Um, it's around the, the question about mitral valve prolapse, Mary. And, um, I'd Joe. like for, for Joe. Um, what's the question? It was about the, the measurements. Wasn't That's it? right. So oh, sorry, it's just the screen just moved. lost. Um, if we this one question, what effect does pregnancy have on heart muscle? Is pregnancy a time of greater risk for those with an inherited condition? Well, the, the, the bottom line is that pregnancy puts extra strain in the heart, and that's very well established. So uh, I think it's important for uh, individuals who have an inherited cardiac condition that they're being managed appropriately. In, in our center, we've got a collaboration between the IC, the inherited cardiac conditions unit and our obstetricians, and we will try and manage in, uh, ladies who get pregnant as a team. Uh, the risk uh, of a pregnancy will be a function of one, the underlying condition, and secondly, the severity of the underlying condition. And we've got uh, uh, individuals who have an underlying cardiomyopathy, for example. Uh, we discuss hypertrophic cardiomyopathy quite extensively, having someone who has significantly increased wall thickness and have significant obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract pose a, a significant challenge. Others who have more mild condition may go through pregnancy without any issues. Uh, 
The same goes for intranelopathy, such as long TT syndrome as well. An important point there is because, for example, ladies who have long TT syndrome may already be on medication and treatment. A classic one will be beta blocker. And again, take some specialist advice because that does not necessarily need to be discontinued, but it can be continued throughout the pregnancy and minimize the risk of arrhythmias as a pregnancy and around the delivery time can potentially increase the risk of uh, such arrhythmias. So to summarize, I think you need to have some expert input and the great majority of pregnancies can be managed appropriately with a successful outcome. Yeah, I think the, the key is LV function. If your LV function is bad, then that is a contraindication to becoming pregnant. And that, that, is, the, that is the key. Poor LV function, a high pulmonary artery pressure, uh, two no goes, and as Michael pointed out, you know, long QT women are at highest risk postpartum. So as soon as they're delivered, the waking in the middle of the night, the change in hormones, the startling effect. So that's when you monitor them very carefully. And the other point they can present with sudden death during pregnancy that the cardiomyopathy, which is silent or undiagnosed. <laughs> They can die suddenly, particularly after delivery, as Sanjay pointed out. So we have pathologists, and, and particularly the ones who look at maternal deaths, cardiac now is expanded as a cause of maternal death compared to hemorrhage and infections in the past. It's now mainly cardiac causes sudden death in, in pregnancy. And I suppose the other thing to be aware of from our perspective is that they don't there's a, a higher risk in pregnancy of um, coronary artery dissection. So if there is a myocardial infarction in someone who is pregnant, always that's something to have on the top of the list as a potential cause of um, the myocardial infarction instead of it being related to atheroma within the coronary arteries. And I think another important thing is just make sure that you have these discussions, particularly if you've got someone as a... Uh, uh, Professor Sarma mentioned who has significant LV dysfunction, who has a high LVOT obstruction with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You need to have these discussions, ideally in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of creating a family early. Uh, don't start having the discussions in high-risk individuals when they're pregnant already. Yeah, I, uh, very nice presentation. I congratulate everybody. And uh, I am Arun Sharma from uh, Hertfordshire. And uh, basically, I have got one or two uh, patients in the system uh, with Kawasaki syndrome. So uh, what is their uh, risk of sudden death, please? <laughs> well, we rarely see it, Joan. We've had about one, two cases of 7,000 that I think that they survived and chattered with Kawasaki's and caused thrombosis and occlusion later in life. From a clinical point of view, you may, but we find it rare for that way. So they yeah, can continue normal, normal lifestyle. Well, it depends on lots of things. So obviously, one thing you've got to ask yourself is how much damage has the Kawasaki disease actually done to the ventricular myocardium? Mm -hmm. So your ventricular function is very important. The second point is clearly Kawasaki's disease. For those of you who don't know it, it's it's it's, it's basically a, a vascular inflammation, usually caused by a bacterial infection in childhood, which results in a very weakened wall with aneurysmal pouching of these of the walls of the um, coronary arteries of the heart. So what happens there is that blood sometimes stagnates in these coronary vessels and can come congealed and, and cause more heart attacks in the future. And sometimes these vessels can even rupture. So clearly, your the the lifestyle, your your risk factors are going to be your LV function, the size of the aneurysm, of course, and and the the treatment here will be dependent on treating the LV function. But more importantly, antithrombotic therapy. Are your patients taking antithrombotics? Uh, I'm not sure really. <laughs> I yeah. don't know the details. Well, so so they need to be on antithrombotic therapy. You need to assess LV function. But one of them is very young. He's only 24. Well, that's a good age. So he's managed, managed to get to 24 with Kawasaki's. Well, that's, that's very good. Yes. Um, so I would say certainly antithrombotics is the, is the mainstay of treatment and make sure the LV function is good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's a question for Joe on your research to do with mitral valve prolapse. I was interested that 
there were differences in the for the patients that died of sudden compression death, there were differences in the dimensions of the mitral valve and the thickness, and also the postrolateral fibrosis. What is the hypothesis behind arrhythmic death in mitral valve prolapse? Is it the pillory muscles, the cordy? Is it is it the fibrosis as a result of the anatomical the abnormality? What, what's the source? So I think from our perspective, um, there, there, there is definitely the fibrosis. I mean, as, as I've shown, it was present about 90%. So we use fibrosis in, as an explain, explanator for, for, for sudden cardiac death in, in a range of different conditions. So I would, that would be what I'd be pointing to. There's also an increase in heart weight in them. We know that increase in heart weight also corresponds to a uh, higher risk of um, uh, arrhythmia and also um, sudden cardiac death as well. So those are the, the two things. But I, I, I'd say I think it's mainly the fibrosis. It's only about 10% that we couldn't really explain it. And there may be some other causes. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think the fibrosis is where I'd be looking at. Were there differences in the mitral valve thickness in those that died suddenly and the annulus? Or... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the annulus was increased in size. The thickness of both the anterior and the posterior leaflet were, was increased. The leaflet length of both the anterior leaflet and all three scallops of the posterior leaflet, as well as the roughened area, which is the redundant area, yeah. essentially where the, the valve closed, was also lengthened as well. So everything was highly significant when we were comparing to normal individuals with normal valves. And do you, so is there a link between that and the fibrosis, do you think? So I, so what has been postulated ha has been that essentially that there is um uh it pulls the 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 valve as it balloons upward pulls on the posterior um, papillary muscle and essentially that that friction and torsion results in damage within the uh, the myocardium itself that's what's been postulated but it, I, I, so I'm not sure it's been categorically proved that's that's the mechanisms that people have talked about. Thank you. I think you've also answered the first part of the question I was looking for in the mitral valve prolapse, but it, the second part was if there are any concerns about mitral valve prolapse, should uh, they be sending the fixed heart to the cry unit? Absolutely. I think it's a, it's, it's a really challenging, difficult diagnosis to make. Um, I, 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 as I've shown, there is like a huge spectrum. I think it's easier in younger people. Once you're looking at younger people and you see marked changes, you can be much more confident but the mitral valve changes in its appearance with age and it does become more challenging as people get older. Um, so yes, absolutely. I would certainly recommend that if there is any query about the mitral valve, obviously we need to have a look at the actual whole heart or at least have a picture of it so we can um, make a judgment on whether we think it was significant in the role of um, causing sudden cardiac death. I mean, I think, I think the biggest concern obviously is how to manage mitral valve prolapse because 1% of the population actually has mitral valve prolapse. And then when you hear about its rare association with sudden cardiac death, it does get cardiologists thinking about how to risk gratify people with mitral valve prolapse. So just on pragmatic grounds, the sort of people that should be referred are those with cardiac symptoms, clearly, such as atyp severe atypical chest pain or syncope. Those people have got T-wave inversion in the inferior leads. Those people with ventricular extrasystoles with wide right bundle branch block and a superior axis suggesting that they're coming from the papillary muscle. And those people with evidence of papillary muscle fibrosis on MRI, those are the sort of high risk groups that we should be focusing on and accumulating in our clinics. We've got a, a mic. Uh, I've got one question regarding the anomalous origin of the coronary artery. Because uh, you mentioned, and uh, actually, according to different studies, this is quite common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested in uh, when you you said that you uh, screened a huge number of uh, younger footballers uh, over the last fifteen years, ten years, uh, doing ECG and echo, uh, which I'm quite sure it's not the the best modality to picked up the the the, the uh, young 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 uh, kids uh, with the anomalous corners so in which way you're actually focused and tried to pick up also the the, the young athletes with the anomalous coronary arteries uh, origin of the coronary arteries so it's just um, 
You know, you make an excellent point. You make an excellent point in that uh, clearly anomalous coronary origins are a recognized cause of sudden cardiac death. And depending on autopsy studies that you read, uh, it, it features sometimes second or the third most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. And this is a situation whereby clearly a coronary artery comes off the opposite origin to where it's supposed to do. And in doing so, it either adopts a slit like orifice or traverses between two big vessels as the pulmonary artery or the aorta and becomes squashed during systole, causing acute ischemia and, and, and suddenly arrhythmias. Now, an ECG will not pick that up. An echo, uh, what we do certainly do is we train our cardiac physiologists to try very hard on the short axis view of the aorta to visualize the origin of the left and the right coronary artery. And I think if, you, if people are experienced, especially amongst these young athletes, uh, they do have good echo windows and you can sometimes see them. But we have certainly seen, you know, I can give you anecdotal examples of two, two cases that we missed. And when we went back and we looked in people who've had adverse events, you could see that the, where we thought the coronary artery was coming from the right, from the correct position, it was coming off anteriorly, but it just looked like we'd seen the origin. So we're not brilliant at, at picking that up. And so our motto is if you're ever dealing with an athlete with chest pain and sudden syncope, go all out, use the correct test. And that is to do a CT coronary angiogram. Clearly, I hope you appreciate the concerns about radiation in very young people. So it's not something that we would offer everyone. But if, if I was worried, I'd do either an MR looking at the origin of the coronary or, or do the definitive test as a CT coronary angiogram. Yeah, I mean, I'll advocate for the cardiac MRI in young people because you can get beautiful images of the proximal third of your coronary arteries. Uh, I think in terms of coronary artery anomalies is one of those conditions that we have to admit that our screen will never be good enough to detect simply because you need to do more advanced investigations. I, I think the screening that uh, Professor Sarma is leading in football players has taken a pragmatic approach. If they can see the coronary arteries on echo, that's fine. They'll document it. If they can't really see it or they're not convinced, they won't drive everyone to CTs and MRIs if they're completely asymptomatic. Uh, but you can see the difference if you compare that study where I don't remember how many coronary anomalies detected, but it was one in 1,000, one. Much less. In fact, we only had about three cases. Yeah, in 11,000 individuals. And then you take the cardiac MRI study that they did in Texas in children, and it was about 1%. Yeah. So obviously, we're missing a, a lot of them. Yeah, but 1%. But, yeah, but I, I will. I, I, I mean, the other thing that is very challenging with coronary artery anomalies is the management of it. Okay, and again, if, if you're gonna suggest a, an operation or intervention, just make sure that you've got really good reasons and it's done in an expert center, uh, because it's not unusual to get a referral of someone who comes with a typical chest pain and he ends up with a CT coronary angiogram and there's a normal coronary artery. You know, if he's in his 50s and he doesn't exercise much, it's unlikely that that will kill him. So you need to make sure that you do the right investigations, look at the uh, uh, functional imaging, and then look at the demographics of the individual, whether they had symptoms, and then come to a decision as to what's the most appropriate management because you know, subjecting someone to a coronary artery bypass graft uh, or intervention, it's not a, a, an easy decision to make. So it needs to be very well thought. From a sudden cardiac death point of view, um, I, I'll just mention, I think we had about 45 maybe of us in our 7,000, but it, uh, it's certainly, I think, under-recognized because I've had a case which was initially examined abroad and had another examination in this country and then referred to us and neither of the two previous examinations had picked it up so I think it's something that's under recognized absolutely we just to emphasize for pathologists is that we always say you've got to look in there it's very obvious you think it should be obvious at autopsy but the pathologist needs to know exactly where the coronary arteries originate and the majority of our pathologists they're busy people, they don't look in detail, and the majority are missed by the general pathologists. And we emphasize that in our publications. Look carefully at all parts of the heart because you're going to miss vital information. And imaging won't help an autopsy to, to determine the origin of the coronary arteries. 
Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the clinicians regarding translational research, really. Um, so Sanjay, um, you did a very good study and you've shown quite a lot of data. Um, preventive healthcare is something the NHS has never really focused on, but we know internationally from other healthcare systems, where we look at screening or preventive healthcare, it actually saves a lot of money for the NHS, but also it decreases the burden of disease. So the screening that you're doing locally within St George's, is that actually happening in centres nationally and then also internationally? No, is the short answer. Um, if, we, if we look at screening in young people in this country, it's predominantly uh, confined to the highest echelons of sport. So you've got to be either nationally ranked or playing at a very high level even to get screened in this country. Uh, other than that, uh, there is a very large uh, charitable organization that I'm very, um, uh, that I have very great affection for called Cardiac Risk in the Young, uh, that actually did really put their heads above the parapet back in 1996 and decided that we should be testing young people. It, it started with athletes and it soon became very clear that uh, more non-athletes die because they're a bigger cohort than the athletes and they started doing it and people initially thought we were insane. Uh, but as I presented some of uh, Michael and Hamish's data, that uh, what uh, our screening has shown that the prevalence of serious cardiac disease in these young individuals is one in 300. Uh, and when you do diagnose these people, something good comes of it. You know, 40% of people had life saving therapies. And you could argue that this may have cost the NHS as opposed to help them because a dead person doesn't cost anything. Uh, but that's not how we should be seeing this. What the way we should be seeing it economically is that we have given individuals decades of life to earn and contribute to society. Yeah, I, I think that that's the point uh, regarding translational research. I wanted to capture is the fact that these people are not are be are active parts of society because you've caught them so early on, and they've actually added to society. So it, it's um, for the economics to look at from a different perspective. Um, and that brings me really nicely on to you, Michael, for some of your presentations. I really like this idea of um, the concern regarding exercise and what we should be doing and almost giving a prescription for, um, for, for, for people that are at risk. Now, um, I, I know I'm taking it really up to, the, up to date. Um, we've got haptics, and we've got metaverse where a lot of gaming happens. And a lot of these individuals are gaming and the heart rate and the blood pressure, et cetera, do go up. And I wonder if there was any data out there, if you've looked at that and during your prescriptions for these younger people, whether you've actually given any prescriptions regarding what they should be doing regarding gaming and things. Because I, I know it's very up to date and, and I do apologize for the question before I ask. No, no, uh, uh, the, uh, the honest answer is no. Uh, in terms of gaming, obviously it's difficult. The, the, the reality is that the hemodynamic demand on the heart is not that great, although yes, they may get a bit of elevated blood pressure, so on and so forth. Uh, however, uh, the way we use gaming is the other way around in terms of promoting physical activity. So uh, there are uh, games that you can use and that utilizes also all the monitoring that we've got available currently because you can get a lot of information in terms of someone's blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen, so on and so forth, while they are able to do an exciting form of exercise that may be more exciting for them than what's for me, but it is, and we are able to use those resources and we start to apply them in our exercise programs, in our research as well, in order to try and promote a physical activity and exercise within the constraints even of a house with something more exciting rather than running on a treadmill or cycling with a bike. So is there research regarding the sort of up-to-date sort of gaming, the more active gaming with the headsets and with the metaverse and things? Yes, yes, there is, and it can, it can be beneficial. It's exactly those sort of gaming issues that we can use in order to... Uh, promote physical activity and exercise in younger people, but also to ensure that we've got the necessary monitoring because you can simply do that and you can essentially perform 
and and COVID advanced that a lot because as you realize oh, most of the exercise in cardiac rehabilitation classes shut off. So we had to find a way of remotely advising and monitoring individuals while they do exercise at home. And that will be a really good model as well in terms of spreading physical activity for people who cannot get to a hospital venue or another venue in the community in that particular date and time in order to do their physical activity. And I think there is great potential with that. That leads me on. Is there any, any research or any ideas for research where you can get these um, gaming done in wherever you can do it, in whichever home you want, but to actually get that data back into a central system using AI and using the big data and actually start analyzing some of that maybe? Yeah, I think that's that's where we're, that's where we're heading, and uh, definitely tele rehabilitation is something that has. I mean, it was developing, but as with everything, COVID gave it. So obviously, COVID had lots of negatives, but it has some positives as well in terms of teaching us and pushing us to move ahead forward, uh, rather than waiting a decade or two two decades to advance that. So that's definitely something that it's building and it's going to be more and more popular in terms of the research field as well. But but you do touch on a good point in that some of these, these games do cause massive adrenergic surges. And there is certainly a study going on at the Imperial remotely examining the heart rates and blood pressure of these young individuals. And the, the, the magnitude, not just the magnitude, but the duration of the adrenergic surge and the effect it has. Um, I don't know if there's any, any parents in the audience or anyone that's heard. Many a time we have had a story where someone was in bed, but they, they, they had their computer with them or something like that. And you don't really know just how much adrenergic surge they'd had before keeling over. So I think some of this, someone was asking me, they, but what they're doing is they're only looking at heart rate response and blood pressure response. What I'd be very interested in, in, in demonstrating is what actually is happening. Is the ectopic burden going up? And I was telling them that they need to make contact with certain uh, groups that, where you can actually see the heart rhythm. Be interested to see if the ectopic burden shoots up. So there is, so on the positive, obviously you use these games to encourage physically inactive people to reduce their burden of atherosclerosis. But on the contra, it'd be interesting to see what effect on the cardiovascular system, these games can have in people with underlying cardiac disease. We're almost there, we're a bit 20 minutes over already, but another question now. Yes, just briefly, we've heard a lot about the, um, about the screening. Um, I'm just wondering when you're dealing with elite or semi-elite uh, adolescents, um, perhaps in football, um, how many, um, ignore your advice, carry on playing, and how do you follow that up? Very good point. And, you know, we had a very paternalistic approach uh, until recently where what the doctor said went. You know, you said, look, you shouldn't play. That was very easy to do that. You know, you, you've just destroyed someone's life and they've walked out of your office and they've been told they can't play football. You know, you don't have to pick those pieces up. Uh, and I think I was always... Certainly my point, I've always said that we shouldn't be saying, you know, and not or permit. We should try and get rid of mandate. We should get rid of words like mandate, permit and stuff like that. It's not for us to mandate and permit. I think what we should do is when we're faced with a young individual who's got a, who's got a risky condition is to sit down and risk stratify them and actually determine exactly the magnitude of that risk, as, as Michael alluded to. Clearly, one can never actually ascribe the exact risks because we don't do our tests in the football setting. Our tests are done in the laboratory, so we can't always predict what's going to happen. What we have started doing is, is using some of these monitors where they wear those monitors and play games just to see what the impact of a true game is on them. Clearly, if, if we think that that individual is deemed at low risk, then what we do is we sit down with the, with the club, with the player, with the next of kin, because it's the next of kin that's going to be upset but with us if something goes wrong and the club and you sit down and have a shared decision making process uh, you know to which that the athlete accepts their risk they've decided to go on to play the club's accepted that risk but the club has done everything they possibly can to mitigate the risk by having personnel around defibrillators around 
making sure that this individual is well hydrated, making sure they go to their clinic appointments, making sure that they don't use stimulants and sorts of other sorts of things. I, I think a, a, an important thing to consider is obviously I've been taught by Sanjay, so my approach is quite liberal as well. But I think it's important to have a liberal approach and important to involve the athlete. And we're lucky in that way in the United Kingdom compared to other countries like Greece or Italy that someone needs to sign a piece of paper for you to go and do your sport or compete. That puts the doctors in a bit of a challenging uh, position. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is for me to take away something from someone, you need to have really good evidence that it's going to cause harm. And people get confused sometimes because when an athlete with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy comes to you, he's not asking what's my risk of dying from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy based on the calculator. He's asking you two questions. The first question is, if I continue exercising, do I increase my risk of sudden cardiac death from the condition? And if that's not the case, do I increase my risk of worsening my condition and expediting the development of the condition? Those are the two questions. And we have to be honest, and that's what I like about the new EAC guidelines, because they recognize the limitations, because there are certain conditions, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in one of them, that we think we've got a reasonable evidence, but for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we really don't, and for a lot of other conditions as well, we don't. Does that mean that there is no risk? No, of course there is risk, but that's the challenge and as you realize, that's more difficult for us doctors, isn't it? It's better to have a yes or a no and put a, a, a signature on a piece of paper rather than sit and have that informed discussion uh, with the individual families and other people who get involved in the decision-making process. But your last question that said, what do you do about it? If someone did have a serious condition, for example, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, we should only get worse with exercise. And they ignored my advice. There was nothing I can do about it. You know, that, that's it. You know, someone has a heart attack and you tell them not to smoke and you see them lighting up outside. There's nothing you can do about it. But as long as you've done your best as the, the ambassador of that individual and given them the best advice, you can only hope for the best. There was a marathon runner who was, I think we spent, you spent two hours with him three weeks ago. I spent two hours with him yesterday who just come, can't come to terms with the fact that he's been diagnosed with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy had a sudden cardiac arrest, got a defibrillator in, and yet he was in the top four marathon runners in his age group. And he just doesn't know what to do with himself. It's very difficult. And he's, he's even saying that he's thinking of starting running again. But um, you can only hope that he doesn't and you can channel him. But it's difficult. And I think these people need a lot of support, a lot of psychological support, a lot of family support, a lot of friendly support as well. Can you sort of... Um... But a percentage on the people who ignore your advice, carry on. I, I can't. <laughs> Most people ignore advice. <laughs> they probably wouldn't tell me anything. <laughs> you can always tell when the heart rate's only 50 beats per minute and they said they stopped exercising. You think, oh, really? <laughs> Sorry? Do you refer those people who don't take advice to see a psychologist or psychotherapist? We do. And, and what we need is more. We need far more do you want to give psychologists uh, and therapists you than we have available. The waiting time, for example, to see a, a psychologist in the NHS is six months. So you've just suddenly told someone they probably shouldn't be trained, exercising hard. And you've told them that you're going to get them help. That help is six months away. So I think we need we need more community support uh, support for young people who have been diagnosed. Obviously, cardiac risk in the young have got this My Heart group, uh, which is an excellent idea, um, uh, uh, and and we need more of that. So I think the three things they need is they need a psychologist or a counselor, which is challenging to find within the NHS. So a lot of the times they go private. Secondly, they need peer groups, support groups, like the one that my heart uh, cries running. And the third thing they need is to introduce them, and that's what I've started, to a good sports scientist who can take your more general cardiology advice in terms of duration, in terms of heart rate, so on and so forth, and create a training plan for them. That will include the components that will keep him 
at your exercise recommendation level. And that's something definitely I cannot do. It has to be someone who is trained on that field. Yeah. Uh, the question that I was going to ask has already been answered, I think now. Uh, it was relating to this, so many different uh, personnel involved in community rehabilitation of these people, cardiologists and psychotherapists, physiotherapists, and the, uh, the uh, community groups and the patient himself or herself. So, and then you said the review and monitoring should be almost a continuous level. And this evidence-based is changing and the same thing about the patient, the patient condition is also changing. So who is keeping the register of these patients and who is overall kind of in charge then? Is there a register in the community of these patients that yes, we, they need monitoring and who is overall in charge? Of course, the decision is made jointly, patient situation, the family, the psychologist and the GP and the cardiologist, and then there's the sports scientist, but who is overall in charge in the community with, with these so many patients in the community, having a register of these patients and then somebody responsible or just left as a joint decision making or what? Well, I'll start with the I'll start with triage, and I think everyone will put their little a bit in as well. I personally think that the the decision to collate data, maybe I'm a researcher, uh, clinical data really lies with the clinician. So if I've got a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, I would want to make sure that the records of that patient we keep. Uh, what is definitely absent is a national database of pe young people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their natural history, their trajectory, we, we are missing that and we should have that. So you'll find that most teaching hospitals or, or centers with an interest have their own collection of individuals, but no one at the moment is properly sharing this data about outcomes, management, best care, gaps. And I think we really do need that. I'm getting more in pathology, but that's only because Mary and Joe are sort of pioneers of cardiac pathology and see so many and publish all this data, but we could even be doing better in that field. But I think our clinicians are lagging behind the pathologists. What do you okay. think, Michael? No, I agree. I mean, I mean, a lot of the time, it's the patient who is in charge of their care, essentially. So as a cardiologist, uh, I mean, the, IC, the inhaled cardiac conditions model helps us in terms of we've got a team of people. It's not just me in an outpatient clinic trying to manage everything. So we've got our nurses, we've got our administrators, we've got the support from CRI who can provide us with counselors, so on and so forth. So we've got a sort of package that we can give to our patients. But in terms of their overall well-being, in terms of their exercise prescription. So this is something that we will have to review in our clinic. You have to remember that even if you refer someone within the NHS for a cardiac rehab program, first of all, in terms of an inherent cardiac conditions, most cardiac rehab clinics will reject them. Uh, either because they can based on the rules or because they are worried uh, because they don't have the expertise. So you need to negotiate that. But even if you do, then that will be a 10, 12 week program, and then that program will end. And the pro problem is that uh, for most of them, their uh, follow up will end and they will come back to your clinic as your patient. You'll see them the year after and you'll repeat your investigations and try and review your advice. So I don't think there is a good enough system for the time being. I think also one of the great challenges, especially young people identified with conditions, you know they'll benefit from joining something like the My Heart Network, the peer-to-peer -peer support, and they might even be identified by the team, but it's it's still their choice whether they engage in that. So it's trying to create potentially informal environments where people can naturally enter into these support environments to get what they need. Um, that's a really challenging area. I'm very aware that we've um, stayed there it's, it's past six o'clock. I, I would like to say a huge thank you to all of you, especially for staying to the end, everyone online. Um, thank you for so many of you for attending and, and joining us. Speakers have been fantastic. 
very much appreciate the being such fantastic speakers there that talk us through this afternoon and also the Royal Society of Medicine. So thank you very much, the Royal Society. Thank you.